I assume that people have seen the last video that we did two years ago. That's right, that was two years, holy oh, shit. Uh, and our lives have changed a lot since then. Yeah. We're both now founders, and so I was like, hey, we should record. I've always admired these like, sort of founder catch-up podcasts. Mm -hmm. that, um, yeah, I was kind of thinking like that. Oh, do you want it in it? I don't know. Well, if you want it in it, then you should move a little closer no, to me, whatever, I guess. Whatever, it was whatever, right whatever, whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't actually minding the camera, but uh, this is, I think this is entertaining. Um, anyway, so uh, you have gone, you started your journey in October That's last right. year. Uh -huh. It's been about seven, eight months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I, I uh, started my journey like one to two months ago. That's right. So that's, that's, uh, that's what it is. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe we talk about like what you, how you started Party, how you got the idea for Party Kit. Uh, just the starting the company and everything, kind of go from there, and then I'll open my turn. Thanks for having me on. <laughs> Extremely honored. Thanks. Also, it's just nice to see you. It's yeah, nice yeah. to hang. And you're right, like the last one was uh, two years ago. Uh, fucking everything's changed since then. Um, yeah. I. Uh, I. Uh, I've said this story now a bunch of times, so I just want to like try to make sure that I'm not really pitching at you anymore, only because I've pitched the story now 200 times to different people, but I can tell you the actual uh, nuts and bolts of it, which is I left Cloudflare. Uh, it was great, fuck, such a great time. So leaving on a high is one of my favorite things to do from a company where I'm like, okay, I think I got a bunch of stuff done, but uh, I have an offer. Uh, after you finish five years as an immigrant in the UK, you get something called ILR, which yeah. means you don't need a visa sponsor anymore. Yeah. I think and I had dinner with you the, the, the week or that. The I month think so, the yeah. Yeah, we went to that nice restaurant uh, and then we got coffee or chocolate afterwards. You were disappointed. We went to Koba, right? We went to Koba yeah. and we had it, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, but honestly, like, uh, ask an immigrant what it feels like to not need a visa sponsor anymore and they'll tell you that there's physical relief. Like, for weeks, I could feel it in my shoulders. It was so weird. Um, I'm just recording. Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something with Cloudflare tech. Like the year I spent inside Cloudflare, it was readily apparent to me that this shit is production ready. Like you can build production systems on top of it. So you got ILR. I got ILR and uh, I knew I wanted to use Cloudflare tech to do something. In fact, by the way, durable objects were announced in 2020. Hmm. Uh, when I was working for a bank, that bank shall go unnamed. Uh, I don't want to talk about my time. There. It may be too big to fail. Yeah, it, it is. It is too big to fail. It exactly is the it is the the symbol of the entire moment. Um, and my original plan when I saw durable objects was, oh shit, I need to build a product company with it. Back in 2020. But really? I, yeah, immediately. Immediately. So that's how like we reached out to Rita, love her. She got us access into the thing. I immediately pinged people inside Cloudflare. I spoke to I spoke to Kenton at the time and I got into a call with him and I was talking to him about it. He's like, why don't you just come into Cloudflare and do this? I was like, yeah, but you know. Did you know Kenton before that? No, literally the first time I spoke to him. Because he was already pretty famous uh, doing something or some rest. That's right. He did uh, Sandstorm, which was acquired by Cloudflare. And he, of course, did... Uh, uh, Captain Proto and uh, the whole bunch of things. A lot of Google stuff. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. And then Rita, Rita's story is actually so I considered joining Cloudflare. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, I'm a big Cloudflare fan. This is going to be a Cloudflare podcast. I assume. Um, both of us are in the Cloudflare startups program, which you got me into. That's right. <laughs> uh, Rita actually, like, apparently her story is that she started as like uh, uh, some more junior level. Mm -hmm. But then, like, just got very, very into durable, uh, into Cloudflare workers, That's and then right. like became a PM for Cloudflare workers, and like now a director. That's right. The program is just kind of cool. It's uh, yeah. Even her story is, her and her sister both work in really? yeah yeah. Dina yeah. Koslov, she works in the SSL, but she's doing a bunch of SSL stuff. Yeah, both of them are in Cloudflare, and they're like big fans, and uh, yeah. they're also big uh, cheerleaders for the company itself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of like. The previous companies I worked at were the bank, uh, Facebook, and you don't really find people who are like extreme fans of the company per se. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In both of these places. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was so wholesome to... Uh, so yeah, I, I I tried building a thing. I couldn't figure out. We couldn't figure out the proper use case, what to do with these objects, etc. Uh, and 
I was like, you know what, fuck it, I'm just going to... Re- I, I tried using their CLI and stuff. Okay, so that's where it also kind of started. I was like, you know what, I should try using this tech. And uh, I hated it. I, I can say this on screen now. Like, yeah. it, it was it was not great. Uh, mostly because it was so... Um, it was so opaque. Like, you, when you use a Rust, uh, Rust-based Rust CLI for anything, if there's an error, you have no idea what happened. Like, it just okay. would spit out. And this, this is Wrangler V1. This is Wrangler V1. And it was otherwise... I think when it shipped, it was incredibly impressive, but uh, after uh, uh, Ashley left, uh, I think it's kind of like slowed down a little bit. Mm. Uh, uh, great team though, but I think it's just such a hard thing to iterate on. More, man, this is how JavaScript development works, right? Like if you're using a tool and you have a problem with it, you'll immediately go to the line of code where the error popped and three times out of five, you'll know how to fix it, so you send a PR. And you can't do that with a tool written in Rust. So unless it's like such a very specific use case, I don't think Rust is such a good fit for general purpose tools like Triangle, especially where like the perf wasn't so much the problem. Net, net, it was network bound at the time. Anyway, so I reached out to them. I was like, hey, I think I want to like help you with the CLI stuff. Like I think I want to help with the developer experience. Uh, did the whole interviews, all great people. Started with the thing and uh, decided we'll rewrite the CLI. Uh, which pissed off a lot of people internally. In fact, Kenton was, I mean, I understand, like, I'm not saying that they were wrong to um, think uh, that this would be a failed project. A new guy walks in and says, yeah, let's just retype the whole thing in JavaScript. Uh, but it worked. Uh, and Kenton also admits to that now. Yes. Uh, and you have a pretty good blog post about the rewrite. Yeah, it was very much a, hey, you know what, like, there were 10 big problems I had with this, and I just worked on fixing all of that. And I, I keep saying I, but, like, there were a number of people... Uh, uh, it, it was a team effort, but no, it was very much me who was like, no, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, send out 100 PRs, whatever. Anyway, so uh, I finished that, and um, after I left, I knew I wanted to do something with Cloudflare Tech, but now I had the background of the context of how the systems work, what it's capable of, what it's not capable of, like trade-offs and everything. Uh, and that's when I started hanging out with, uh, I, I was already hanging out with Steve Ruiz. Uh, in fact, Rachel Neighbors introduced me to Steve. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and uh, they were moving away from their existing multiplayer solution. Uh, it was too expensive. It wasn't a great fit for the general purpose tools like that service and any other third party service, they suffer from three, three or four big problems, all of them. Uh, uh, a, it's hard to do a local dev experience unless it's open source, like to be able to run it locally. So uh, if you want to write tests, uh, it's hard if it's a third-party service. Uh, if it doesn't have the feature that you need, you have like one or of like two or three options, right? Like either you have to recreate it around their infrastructure, uh, you have to change your product, or you don't do it. All three are horrible options. And uh, yeah, it's it's a third-party service for this is always like makes uh, you you want to be able to write your own code. You want to be able to like, treat it like any other developer tooling that you have. You want a programmable platform. And I was like, wait, this sounds like a perfect fit for durable objects. Like literally a perfect fit. So that's where V0 of PartyKit was born. I was like, hey, how quickly can we make a deployment platform for this very small team of engineers? I think at the time there were three engineers. I was like, yeah, we, you should not have to be a subject matter expert at distributed systems or CRDPs or whatever it is. That being said, they have David Sheldrick on the team who's a fucking legend. Who created a uh, patch, patch package. package. That's right. Yeah. Also, reactivity is kind of like his life's work. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I quickly made the deployment stuff for them and they built the syncing engine. They tried CRDTs, a bunch of other like uh, packages. They didn't like any of them, so they built it from scratch. Anyway, long story short, uh, we had a prototype ready in a week and it was production ready within like six, seven weeks, which is kind of unheard of for a team that size. And it's great. TLDraw.com. Hit the share button and <laughs> keep multiple devices next to each other and see how fast it is. It's amazing. It's not peer to peer. And what is the canvas scrolling thing? Uh, I really like that one. Uh, together. It's together.tldraw.com. Yeah. Uh, I was chatting with Steve while he was uh, doing something and I, I I saw him drawing and I was I was like writing and he was writing back to me. Yeah. It was such a unique chat experience that I never had before. It's so fun. I. Uh, uh, I love that service because anytime you put it out on Twitter, like, hey, here's a, yeah, yeah. let's get on to t- a table. Uh, as you can imagine, it's about, it, it takes about four or five minutes and, until the dicks and the racists show up, okay? <laughs> but I, there's a unique form of community moderation that I really like. 
So yeah, anytime yeah. somebody yeah. draws a swastika, somebody comes along and makes it a tic tac toe table, <laughs> which is I was like, and it keeps happening like over an hour, which means there are different people doing it. It's not usually the same person. It's amazing. It, that was my favorite social <laughs> phenomenon, a thing like that that happened. Uh, anyway, so I started building the thing for. Uh, I was like, this is amazing, and I should build this for everyone. And I just made a Twitter account and started sending screenshots. And Sean, the fucking inbound interest was wild. Like, honestly, it hasn't... For a party kit. For a party kit. I was like, hey, party kit exists and it's going to do so-and-so things. I had most of it working within like two or three months and it escalated. Um, How many lines of code is party kit, like the MVP? Uh, the developer tooling is... Uh, just ballpark. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah the are talking like 2,000? All in all, probably about two or 3,000 lines of code. Yeah, that, that was my initial impression as yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Like, like, which is primarily like state management and like kind of on, on top of the durable objects. So no, so there are two parts to it. There's the, there's the background worker thing, which I, it's the edge platform part where your code actually gets deployed, gets trapped in the special stuff and gets deployed onto the backend. Uh, that's about a thousand odd lines of code. Yeah. And the developer tooling, the CLI, ah, yeah. the libraries, etc. that's about yeah. 1,500, 2,000 lines of code, I want to and, say. And, and do you have, uh, so something that you may not know about me is to actually maintain the CLI for Netlify. Okay. Including Netlify Dev. Uh, and essentially what we did at Netlify was, uh, yeah, it was written in JavaScript. Uh, I actually taught a CLI workshop on like how to write CLIs with Node.js. Uh, surprisingly popular because This is the Oak Cliff one, right? Oak Cliff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody yeah. teaches about this. Yeah. Uh, you just have to kind of like look at other CLIs and learn it. Yeah. So that was the only guy that I know who like had done a CLI course. Um, but one thing that we did was actually like compile the rules engine, uh, which is written in C plus plus, into WebAssembly and then ship it as NPM module so that you can run it in uh, in your CLI. What rules engine? Uh, oh, the the, 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 the rules. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right, so right. that everything that you deploy to the production thing is like line for line exactly the same that you get in the, in the local environment. Mm -hmm. uh, does Cloudflare give you any? thing to do that. Like, here's the production stuff, blah, 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 here's, here it is in local. Uh, so, or do you have to mock every single behavior, which is impossible, right? So the routing stuff is not something that you bother about with local dev anyway, but until literally last week, uh, it the local development environment was a simulation written in JavaScript. Right. In fact, it was created by someone who was a student at Cambridge. Uh -huh. It was uh, Brendan, a uh, stunning talent, by the way. Um, did you hire him? They did hire him. They started last year. Yeah. Like, Cloudflare hired him. Uh, and uh, only last week did they ship uh, Wrangler, the CLI, but with the actual uh, workers' runtime. It was right. otherwise a simulation that uh, here. Yeah, but. because and, there's always disparity, right? Right. So, in fact, like until this happened, uh, there were two modes that you would do local dev in. One was you'd run the the simulation environment, or it would actually spin up a remote dev environment on the edge, on Cloudflare's edge. That matched the environment actually. Mm. That's yes. The, yeah. So yes, yeah. which is why, like, for the longest time. Which is why even the choice of Rust for the CLI didn't make sense because most of the thing was happening over the network anyway. Like there wasn't much to <laughs> like Rust wasn't really useful per se uh, at the time. Um, it's uh, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. Um, so um, that being said, I don't use that for uh, party kits, uh, uh, local development right now. In fact, I'm using Vercel's Edge Runtime, which is another simulation environment written in Node. Do you want to talk about Cloudflare Runtime versus Vercel Edge Runtime? I mean, so first of all, actually, it's by the way, like, it, it's it's the worst kept secret. It's not clear to me why it's a secret. Why, yeah. Why, 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 yeah, yeah. Is it charging? It is charging. It is charging. It is charging. No, I, I it goes to sleep. I oh, have okay. an app. I have an app called Caffeine. Oh, that keeps it. Awake. That keeps it awake. Uh, no. So now, now it's drinking caffeine, and then it won't sleep. So I don't understand why it's a secret or like why it's not, but, but okay, so Vercel's Edge Runtime, once you deploy, is Cloudflare workers. Yes. Like, not their runtime running on separate hardware. No, it's using Cloudflare's Edge platform. That's how it's so fast. That's why it has zero startup time. That's why uh, the latency is so low because it's using Cloudflare's platform, etc. But why is this a big deal to you? I know it's not a big deal, but uh, for some reason, Vercel calls it like the Vercel Edge Runtime, but mm -hmm. their Local development is 
another separate simulation environment that they built. That's like okay. standards, uh, uh, which is like web standards based, etc. And uh, and it's a weird turnaround story where Party Kit's local development environment is kind of a forked version of Vercel's edge local dev edge runtime. You know? <laughs> and I needed that because like I needed to be able to run in. Like I had a good reason to do it. By the way, like I had to abandon all the code that I wrote for one year in Cloudflare and rewrite it from scratch. It's because I need to be able to. Uh, I have a plan where I'm going to be able. To, I need to be able to run it in um, browsers and other environments. Uh, and uh, the Cloudflare runtime right now doesn't have a story for that. Okay. Um, so uh, and again, Sorry, that was like a detour. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's that's it's it's a weird roundabout story. You, you are like one of the few people that know all this, you know. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy, I'm happy yeah. to talk about it yeah. if anyone asks me. Yeah. Also, I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. It's a weird little situation, but it's not. Uh, that's why standards are nice. Like it mostly works anyway. Um, uh, versus edge runtime right now. The reason I had to fork it is because that doesn't support web sockets, and Particate is clearly very heavily web socket uh, based. Mm. So I had to take that, make my modifications to it, inject a bunch of stuff. It's honestly, it's a lot of fun. I'm happy to go into a tech deep dive some point. That's what I did for three months. Just dived it into it, into it, and said, "Well, how do I make this whole thing work end to end?" Um, okay, so that's kind of like the product story. The company story is the weird one. That's the okay. thing that we should be talking about. I think. Um, at some point, I realized that. Not only is the idea good, but it's important, uh, which meant I wanted to build. I'm glad that I came up with the idea first and then decided to build a company on top of it. There are so many people who otherwise say, hey, I want to be a founder. I need ideas. Uh, that's like usually a mismatch because you never actually want to do it here. Like I'm like, fine, I'll fucking do a company. It means I have to make I made a Delaware C Corp yes. and uh, I have lawyers and accountants who take all my fucking time. I swear that is the most annoying part of this journey by the way. Like they're good lawyers and accountants but it takes months to like seal the deal and uh -huh. finally uh, I'm not even just thinking. you mean just to engage them or for them to do something that you need them to do? Both. Okay. Uh, and simply the way that I've had to do it is there's a US company yes. and, a, and, the, and I have a UK subsidiary. So that way yeah, I get to, to you. Yeah, exactly. You pay, so, pay, pay yourself. That's exactly right. Just so that I can, uh, that I'm able to pay myself a salary. Okay. And for this thing to work is a whole lot of like moving parts. I still have to make like an intercompany agreement so that I can transfer money from the US account to the UK account. The reason that I made it a US company is, well, a lot of my customers are going to be there, but some of my investors are also like, they yes. were, they were like, it has to be yep. C Corp. I was yeah. like, fine. I'll do it. How hard could it be? I said while not knowing how hard it actually is. So you incorporated in the UK first? Uh, I had my, that was the company that I made in October. Like as cool I quit, Computer Club. Cool Computer Club, which is the best company ever. <laughs> uh, I'm giving out uh, uh, email addresses for a charity, by the way. If you want your name at coolcomputer.club.com, uh, feel free to donate to a charity. Give me proof, I'll give you the address <laughs> and forward all your. You get it for free. You're my okay. friend. I'll still donate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, oh, I, actually, this is the first time I'm saying it. That's the idea I've had in my head. It's a good email address, and I'll turn, make it, like, for something good. Donate uh, $100 to a charity, and you get an email address for, like, the Cool Computer yeah. Club. Uh, but there, there's a lot, so I have a few founder friends who incorporated in the UK, some in Ireland, and then they had to do the flip. Uh, is that what you have to do? Or? Pretty much, exactly. Okay. So, uh, it, the US company now wholly owns the UK company yeah. with the same name. Uh, this is what TLRAW does as well, by the way, TLRAW has a US thing. They have a US company, a UK subsidiary, but that's also run by a US citizen. <laughs> this is why you need lawyers and accountants to manage these things. This is relevant for me because uh, at some point I will move back to Singapore, uh -huh. and uh, so I need a Singapore entity, because the US entity needs to own the Singapore entity. So. It might actually be easier to do it because I started. Yeah, US. exactly. The US company is actually I started. Did, I did it with this intention. So. Okay, okay, yeah. So that was... The, that's what I should have done. Or I should have not agreed to have a US company. I told, I, I have a, I have a French founder who like, yeah, we're all in French. I, I, I was like, I know, but trust me, just start in the US first. Just start in the US. <laughs> yeah. Because then you can just use Stripe Atlas, get yes. running within a weekend and then yes. worry about the rest later. Yes. Um, so yeah, deciding to do a company is trying to do a raise. This is my first encounter with VCs and like learning the types of Venture firms that are there, those that are good for you, those that are bad for you. So many will just lie to your face and tell you how handsome and funny you are. Um, 
And you had no, um, okay, my VC story is very different, but you basically interviewed 100 VCs. I did 60 firms and 60 angels. Yeah, I did, I did about, I did 108 meetings in two weeks. So why did you choose to do that for yourself? Uh, I, uh, I had some, you can spread it out more. Is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, I had some advice, but that's just it. Like I wanted to compress it simply because I wanted to f get it fucking done with so that I can move back to the thing. But it worked to my benefit. Uh, the big benefit is it turns out these people talk to each other. Yes. So they heard that something was going on. Yes. And then they're the ones who started reaching out to me, um, uh, which was fine. Like I was just ready for the pitch. I was like, yeah, I'll pitch to you any day, any like any time of the day or night, like as long as you get on the call and uh, this thing to me. Um, and did you set goals before you started pitching? Kind of like I had a rough number in my mind uh, and I exceeded that. It turns out that even with the state of the industry and the economy the way that it is, if you have a boring idea that has a fairly good revenue plan and you come across as someone who believes in it and like has a plan, like you know your shit, uh, there is still money in the in, in uh, venture. The, you, you, you will probably get venture funding. I think that's yeah. the big thing that I learned. And this was November? No, uh, February. This February. Wow, it seems like so long ago. <laughs> I know, man. Like, so many things have happened since then. <laughs> oh, let's stop talking about me for a while. Let's talk about small, no, man. man. I am oh, so it's... excited about this. You decided to basically say all in on AI. You got yeah. AI filled and AI you filled. got into the thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where do I start? Uh, so first of all, I, I really like the way that you tell your story. Uh, I think it's uh, you exude confidence, and I feel like I don't have that level of confidence that you do. Um, but I do, I do need to believe in myself, like you, like you do, uh, and as much as you believe in me. Yes. I am happy to be your hype man. Exactly. I mean, in a, with a like a sixty second warning, I'll jump on any fucking call and tell you, Sean, you really come on, man. Uh, especially also because um, you know you are a solo founder. Um, I. And I, you know, I, long story short, I tried to not be a solo founder, and more or less now I am a solo founder. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a path that is less charted than, than others. Uh, but anyway, so the, the, I mean, the, the longer context is that I have always been looking to do a startup. And right. I've been very patient about this because I know that once you decide to do something, you have to do it for 10 years at right. least if, if you're lucky. And um, I haven't had any job for longer than four years, you know. Um, and, and so um, I, after, essentially like, Temporal was supposed to be my stripe, was supposed to be my sort of big break, and uh, essentially had disagreements with new management coming in and didn't enjoy working for anyone that this guy hired, um, working with anyone that this guy hired. Uh, so I left, um, and I was like, okay, maybe data is my thing. So I, 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 I uh, spent nine months at Airbyte. That's uh, right. I really liked that it was like open source and community driven and all that. Um, and it was a very good job. It was, it was, a, it was my first like, sort of VP management type job. Um, I was presenting to the board um, and like, you know, uh, managing a team. Um, the, and, then, and then AI happened. And I'm not completely new to AI. Uh, so the, the context of this is back when I was a trader, uh, in London, actually, mm -hmm. I was working at Standard Chartered, oh, yeah. and I was an options, I was a currency options uh, trader. Um, I learned to code in Haskell. I learned Haskell before JavaScript, before Python. Oh my so god! So my, my learning habit is fucking weird. Yeah. Um, but actually, uh, the way that option traders trade is uh, they, they they have a lot of prices and information coming in, in from Bloomberg, and they would try to mentally keep it in their heads to make to, in order to turn around and make prices for their customers. Um, and uh, I was like, that seems inefficient. I can't remember that my memory's not that good. So I basically coded up a small app in Haskell that uh, you could cut a copy and paste all the prices, uh, pieces of information in natural language, in the language that the brokers would use to, to communicate and the customers and the salespeople would all send you pieces of information. And just copy and paste it, put it in a little logbook, and it would parse that and then it would, it would output like auction prices and start to store that as, as your daily trade of uh, a log of trades. So that was my first NLP application, uh -huh. done entirely with Regex. So cool. <laughs> like, so fucking cool. Okay. It's, it, I think it's still, some version of it is still live instead of charted. Uh, I made it for myself, and then uh, pretty soon the, the entire global trading desk was using it. Uh, and that was probably my first hint that I should have been a programmer rather than a trader, but I took another six years to figure out that I wanted to code. Um, wait, wait, so why did you go from 
Even if you said you wanted to be a programmer, how come you hit uh, front-end programming? Was it just because it was the most accessible? Yes. Right. JavaScript. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, okay. So the the reason about front-end, there there is a practical reason, and then there is the simpler reason. The simpler reason is it is more accessible, right? Yeah. All the boot camps teach it. Uh, it's easy to get a job there, um, so on and so forth. The more practical reason is uh, when I was at my hedge fund. Uh, I was doing a lot of uh, data pipeline cleaning, model running, and all that. Uh, again, none of this, well, all, all of my Python skills was learned on the job. Didn't have any formal education in any of this. Um, but every time my boss would want me to rerun uh, any models or like change any assumptions, I would, be ha I would have to be the one to do it. Right? I would have to go into my Python notebook and then change this, change this, and rerun, and then do that. And I realized that actually I was the bottleneck. Right. If I can decouple myself, my uh, my users from myself in running the code, um, then I could spread it out to everybody, and that was the success of the option pricing uh, app in, in my previous job. Uh, so essentially, what I was working towards is the value of UI that users can interface with the app to to do what they want to do without your intervention. You just set up the knobs and uh, inputs for them to to, to do that. So. Um, I, I, do, I do think that the, the value of a product, if you want to do end-to-end, -end, you need to basically have good UI, uh, good backend, good data, um, you know, like, and, and basically I just wanted that full stack. Like, I looked at the, the sort of very successful indie hackers, like Peter Levels, of course. Uh, and they, they just know everything, right? They, they know front-end, back-end, everything. Uh, and at the time, I was basically more back-end, back-end um, So. So then I was like, okay, let's learn front end. And then you learn front end, you're like, oh, you should learn Angular. No, you should learn React, right? Uh, actually, I started with Vue first, mm -hmm. then I went to React, then I went to Swell. Long oh, story. Uh, but React mostly you just learn because it's you know the, the most popular framework, right? Everybody. And, and uh, that's that's the, that's the story there. Um, so that's the that's my dabble of NLP. And then fast forward another five years, um, I started getting a little bit insecure about my my qualifications. So then I enrolled in an online master's in um, computer, computer science at Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've heard of this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. It's like a legit master's. It's very cheap, it's so $10,000. Um, and then you, you, get a, you get a proper master's from a well-regarded uh, university. Um, and I picked a machine learning specialization. Um, I had always regarded machine learning as the Moore's law of our time. Um, semiconductor progress is more or less stalled in terms of efficiency. But that's probably not true to some extent, but I think that it is definitely tapering off. Um, but you can, uh, I always had this chart. It, it, for a long time, my Twitter banner was this chart of um, image, uh, human face generation from year to year. So you can see 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, yeah. and it was just getting better and better and better. Now we can do it like nobody's business and uh, we complain about hands. You know? yeah. that's, that's the state of things. I think um, we've stopped complaining about hands actually in the last two, three weeks. We still do. Uh, okay. So the, the Brev shirt that uh, Netter, Netter has, uh -huh. uh, is a mid-journey generated skeleton, but the hands were wrong. So I had to <laughs> manually fix it. Right. Um, so I was like, yeah, you know. So I did some basic courses in um, machine learning, reinforcement learning, uh, that kind of stuff, um, and that was more about, more or less about it um, until Stable Diffusion last year. This is uh, August last year, mm. and when Stable Diffusion happened, you're like, oh, okay, I can run this on my laptop. Yeah. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of hackers around it, um, and I did not see this coming. Right. There, there was there was just it went it went from like haha gpt3 was was a big so gpt3 was released in 2021 mm. and there's a lot of buzz about it and then it died down exactly. so most people were like whatever like it's overhyped uh, bullshit again then everyone was about crypto um <laughs> they also released dolly which also kind of made a small splash and then nothing happened even mid journey the early version was like really alien looking like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, i think stable diffusion was the first time where you were like wow okay um there's something going on here that like, mm. I, I don't know about um and obviously at the time i was in my fancy job at, at airbyte and you know trying to be a manager uh trying to learn the data ecosystem trying to uh, be an authority on like developer relations and all that um, and then when something like stable diffusion comes along, you realize that all of that is nonsense and not meaningful at all. It is the small, uh, I kind of consider it the B plot uh, to the A plot. So in, in TV series writing, TV comedy writing, you always have the A plot, which is like the overall arc of the story yeah. for the full season. And then the B plot is like the thing that starts and ends in the same episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all this stuff, like be a manager, uh, you know, doing performance reviews, setting OPRs, 
Oh, this is B plot. A plot is um, humanity is learning how to create artificial intelligence. <laughs> yeah, I dig it. Actually, that's that's such a good framing. In fact, I guess that's how you get filled, right? Like once you see it, you can't see, unsee it. Yeah. You no, can't no, wake no, up nothing, in the morning. You can't go to your is, job. Yeah. You're, you just. I cannot argue about like uh, Jamstack. Uh, Who cares? <laughs> I can't argue about serverless uh, versus uh, microservices. Yeah. Like this it, is B plot. That's all B plot shit. Yeah. That yeah. is such a good framing. Yeah. So so then you're like okay, but well, then there's a question. There's always other A plot stuff. Another A plot stuff. Uh, climate change, global warming, right? Like, how come you choose to get involved in this one and not that one, mm. right? And so, pure, pure simple answer is uh, it is software, so I can do something about it. Climate change, it's very hard to do something about it. That's so right. personal agency and uh, distance to the problem is, I think, is, is important to me. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's that's a plot, and, and so that was so I, uh, and it was basically a career change which I've done before, right? This is another part of me that uh, people know, uh, which is I changed my finance to tech. When I did that, uh, the the game the game plan is basically the same that I did this this time around, which is nights and weekends you read and learn. Uh, um, on the side about this new domain, and you just immerse in it, you learn the history, you learn learn the basics, and after six months, if you still like it, then you can quit, right? Um, but when you quit, go go full, go cold turkey, um, all in. Uh, so that's what I did uh, when I was thirty, and then I did it again when I was thirty-six, and uh, and that's and that was uh, so August till till now. Um, and so, um, so deciding to do AI, what, what was that mean? What was that mean? What, what was that mean? Um, I think that was mostly just me um, uh, exploring like the different modalities and the, looking at the different opportunities and seeing like what opportunities there could be. Um, and I had opportunities to join uh, Anthropic. I had opportunities to join Notion AI. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways for existing engineers with existing skill sets to transfer over. Um, so for me specifically, was uh, either uh, as a prompt engineer at Anthropic or as a product manager at Notion. Um, uh, and you don't have to have like a PhD to, to do any of this. Uh, I did write a fairly popular post that about like the, the number of ways you can contribute in AI without a, a PhD. Um, and I think like ultimately, the most compelling thing. For me, was the, the fact that I think that I sensed the switch from larger models to, uh, or, or like people tiring out from the, the this this story about like, you know, the small circle, big circle memes. Like, yeah. You can't. You yeah. like wait till GPT four arrives. You don't know how big the circle is. Uh, and, By the way, those guys uh, have clearly haven't retract, retracted their statements yet. But <laughs> it yeah. is bigger. Uh, the, the rumor. So GPT three is uh, 175 billion parameters. Uh, GPT four is rumored to be a trillion. Yeah. Uh, but we don't know because OpenAI is no longer open. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, like figuring out like you have you're basically looking at a completely unstructured space, and you have to kind of ramp up on like where the state of the art in each of them is, and then also have to decide where you think you can make a significant contribution, given that you don't know everything, which is was very challenging and took me a long while. Um, and so I think the, the most interesting thing to me was just this uh, one thing I do is definitely listen to every podcast out there, listening to all the main move, main movers and then track uh, their interests and, and, and motivations. And I think the for me the overlooked opportunity was uh, every large model lab was hiring all these uh, large model researchers. And there's a small group of basically model optimization people, uh, model distillation people, anything to do with small models that were basically shouting to the void and overlooked. And I felt like there were so many interesting results that came out that uh, was that was compelling that people were just not regarding at all because the large model labs at like OpenAI um, emphasized this like centralization force, like we are building AGI. Mm -hmm. that, that is the goal of, of, of what we're doing. Um, everything, every GPT version that we release is a step towards AGI. That's the only thing that matters. Um, forget everything that you're doing. Just just call it endpoints, and and, that, and your, your your needs will be served. Um, and I think like there's a small contingent of people that are like, sure, but also there's very practical needs that, that we have that um, are not being solved. That that other techniques are, are fulfilling very well. So one of the um, one of the most clarifying moments for me was actually there was this paper that came out from Microsoft's research uh, called Flame. 
I think it was called Flame. I forget the, the, mm. the acronym for it. But it was a small model that only um, does Excel formulas. 60 million parameters, you can run it in the browser. Yeah. And it fixes your Excel formulas, it auto-completes your Excel formulas, and if you don't really know the exact formula, it can match it to you and, and rewrites it. It does one thing well, fast, cheap, and, 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 and you know, it doesn't end the world. It's like, well, okay, that's, that's interesting. Like this, this small team of, of people researching can do that. Right? It seems like a safe um, and reasonable thing to do, and you use it hundreds of times. Five yeah. No, like immediately useful. <laughs> like not not as a theoretical. Oh, you need to rewrite your code. Yeah. No, like literally, you can start using it on days ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. And and then you also um, you know, you also hear about how uh, there's all these advances in terms of uh, our understanding of these models. So um, one of the most interesting findings in all of machine learning or, or large language models is this concept of the scaling law in terms of training. So there's this multivariate equation that you have to solve between how much data do you need, how much, how many parameters in the size of the model, um, how long do you train them, and how much, uh, how much compute, I guess. That, that, how long you train and how much mm. compute is, is basically tied together. Let's just say three, those three things. There's, there's more factors, but uh, those three are the, sure. the, the highest. Um, and for a long time, like, people kind of didn't really have a, uh, a way to do that. They just kind of we got to the, the, the yeah. board and, and tried to understand them. Um, I think OpenAI in 2020 um, basically made the first influential paper, it, it literally called Scaling Laws or Large Language Models, um, uh, and the lead author, Kaplan, um, is, is what this law is named after, which is essentially a rule of thumb. We, they looked at like performance across uh, benchmarks and, and, and the loss metrics that they have, and basically said, okay, um, you need uh, 1.7 tokens per parameter. Right. Yeah, I remember. So this is the Kaplan's Kaplan, scale. Kaplan scaling laws. Yeah. Um, and 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 basically GPT three was trained based on that. Um, so uh, they had you start with a you start with a, a total data set that you collected um, of like something like three hundred billion tokens, and you train a one point uh, one hundred seventy five billion parameter model. Um, all right, sounds good. GPT three was impressive. Um, and then like a year later, Google DeepMind comes comes back and goes, actually no, instead of one point seven, it should be twenty. So, uh, so in, in other words, GPT-3 is way too big, okay. way too big. Right. So the way that Google proved it, according to them, because because it's Google, they always say they, they've done something and but never release it. They never release the actual thing. Uh, so they, they train a 70 billion parameter, GPT-3 is 175 billion parameter. They train a 70 billion parameter model and showed that it was way better than GPT-3 on every measure. Mm. So smaller equals better if you get the scaling laws right. And and that kicked off like a huge wave. Uh, so this is the Chinchilla paper that, that models called yeah, Chinchilla. Sure. So that, no, that's right. Like yeah, that was followed by Lama, the uh, Lama uh, rates leak from Facebook. So the, so uh, so Chinchilla was going from one point seven to twenty, uh, and it's uh, and it's and it's way smaller and, and more capable, right? Seems like hey, there's 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 no sort of no. Uh, trade off here. Uh, there, uh, there are trade offs in some capabilities that, that they lose, but uh, it's stuff that we happen to not care about. Hmm. Llama, 200. Oh, shit. Oh, I did not know that. Yes. Okay. So, all the new models now, this as of this year, because of Llama, are like ignoring Chinchilla uh, and going 10x more. So, we've gone from 1.7 to 20 to 200. Right. So, then obviously, obvious question is like, well, why not do that? Right? Like, yeah. Open question right now, probably somebody will try it. Uh, you need to, like, each of these runs, they'll spend, like, you know, uh, GPT-3 costs $50 million to train, like, you know, it's, it's... No, the Llama thing basically meant that you can now run LLMs on consumer device. hardware. That is the, that suddenly has kicked off a exactly. whole other exactly. exposure. Because now it's small enough to, to, to run on your phone. Uh, Even if it's slow, it doesn't device. matter. Like, you, exactly. so that, that is a problem. Yeah, and, and so you can, you can retroactively look at Stable Diffusion and Stability AI as the first successful small model company. Right. Okay. That, that instead of Dolly, instead of Midjourney, then you need to run on some central server with dedicated NVIDIA GPUs. You can run it on your local device, right. uh, and it's so popular and successful because of that. Uh, so th- yeah, so th- basically, I was looking at all these trends. I was like, wait, like small models actually are very powerful in the 60 million parameter tiny tiny flame Excel model range, and the like, pretty mid-sized Llama Llama style things. Mm. Um, the, re, the way that you need to train all these things is essentially um, distill models and, and, and get a lot of data. And so basically the name of the game is to collect data. 
um, and to basically encourage people to use smaller models that only do one thing well. Um, most people, uh, and, 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 and so I started forming this thesis around December, January. Uh, I remember I distinctly had the idea in a car ride with Alessio, actually. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. he like saw it happen. Well, Alessio is a great foil to you in general for uh, months now, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I've been very lucky to, to meet yeah. him. He basically, I, I ran this uh, DevTools investing Discord, I DevRel investing Discord uh, for about two plus years now. Mm. And he joined very early. Um, and then we just started talking on Discord and then met, met in person and then we just got you know, closer and closer together and now, and now we're partners and everything. Um, so, so I was like, okay, like there, there will be a small model company. There isn't really one after stability. Everything else is going larger context, larger parameter size, larger everything. Um, so it seems like this is a sustainable area that is overlooked and is potentially profitable. Um, and in fact, one last piece of um, com uh, comment before I'll, I'll talk about the company formation and all that um, on, on like why small. Um, a lot of, uh, when I first talked about this idea with other VCs, they were like, okay, like, you know, small for niche use cases. That, that's, um, that's, that's what you're going for. And there's a long tail niche use cases. And I said, no, that is exactly opposite. Um, you want small models for cheap, uh, that are cheap and owned by you for the large head of use cases that are all the same. Mm. Um, I will call summarization API 100,000 times a day. But if I need to, do something creative, like explain Transformers in the style of a 1940s gangster, I will call GPT-4. Oh, you doity that there's a Transformer. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, sure, okay. I mean, so basically like the workhorse, the high traffic, high volume, boring stuff that people use for work, mm -hmm. actually is the, the the stuff that is most common and most distillable. Yeah. And the most creative stuff, sure, leave it to the AGI. Um, and that, that really flipped that guy's uh, opinion of me. Because <laughs> he was like, oh, there's money here. <laughs> That's right, exactly. <laughs> so, so, uh, um, so I think I, I, I made, made, some, made some progress there. Um, and then so, so uh, yeah, any other questions on like why small? Anything else? Uh, mostly comments, but I'm just impressed that you, uh, that you systematically came up with the thesis, which means that you have like a very deep context on. Took a while. Well, I started, I started out now. like messing around with like uh, stable diffusion UIs, and I was like, oh, I'm a you know front end person, I can do image manipulation. Sure. And, I, and then like these guys, you know, there, there's so many people out there who are so much more creative than me. Uh, the one that really won that war in my mind was uh, Chris Cantrell. Um, he wrote a Photoshop plugin with stable diffusion. So what you could do is you paste an image into Photoshop, and then you would like use Photoshop's existing tools, but then be able to prompt it with stable diffusion. To fill in the, the blanks, right, he, yeah. he had this like really nice gift of like him uh, composing an art piece. Yeah, like keeps adding stuff with he like like write a little text, it yeah, fills yeah. in more of yeah, the yeah. image. I saw that. That's amazing. Yeah. And uh, he was briefly hired to be VP of Product at St uh, Stability AI, uh -huh. and then recently left. Oh shit. Okay. Uh, some t some drama there, which I don't know about. Sure. Uh, but I looked at the guy. I was like, okay, I'm not going to win this fight. I've never been the most visual person in the world. Um, so I was like, okay, I'm, but I know how to write. I'm, I'm a good writer. Uh, I'm a text guy. Uh, I'm a business-minded person. Uh, I can find use cases there. Yeah, so that's where I, that's uh, that's the direction that I went. Uh, it's funny that you were talking. You were mentioning how uh, OpenAI, etc., are all about the large foundational models. But in conversation with people, like just because I was part of an event where I saw this just happen. Uh, even OpenAI is admitting that the future is going to be very few large foundational models and an entire industry of uh, uh, use case specific uh, yeah, models. It models. just uh, and that is going to be the business. And yeah. basically now, how do you convert uh, capital into uh, electricity into compute into models? Mm -hmm. Like that's that's going to be the next ten years, I guess, of the yeah industry. yeah another A plot thing that's happening. That's a uh, that's a long running thread of Sam Altman is essentially his other investment fusion. Yeah, in fusion energy. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think for him, he has three goals, right? One is um, AGI, two is abundant energy, and then three is uh, longer lifespans. Uh, that's his that's his third investment. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we if we get there, then, then great. <laughs> uh, again, like all those things. I mean, what I'm doing now is still 
you part compared to his own dad stuff. But like it's it's a little bit more. Oh, part. someone is always somebody else's be part. Yeah. Is that is that the phrasing? Yeah, I guess there's always a bigger fish. I well, think. at least it gives you motivation to keep making it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I do I do like uh, really ambitious people that I meet. You know, I, I met this other guy who's uh, working on a custom GPU and um, he's struggling to raise money. Uh, when as compared to all these like B2B software guys like us. Mm. Who are like, yeah, no problem, like 100 VCs in, in one week, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you get those meetings super easily right now. But and you they, they want, no, one, no one wants to talk to that guy, you know? Well, the GPU thing actually has also has use cases in the same domain. Yeah, yeah. So, you started off, uh, it's called Small.ai. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and when I had the idea, I was like, I'm going by the domain first. Yeah, <laughs> I saw it. It was $500 yeah. for Small.ai and then um, SMAOL, because the actual English word was 20k. Oh, shit. Yeah. Fine, worth it. But then in the last week, two weeks, you had another outrageous success. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Small yeah. developer. Okay, so that skips a, skips a few. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so this is that. January and right, last May. Right. Uh, so in January, I was like, okay, uh, I'm still in my job right now. I need to start. And you were in Miami at the time? I was in Miami. Right. Best US city Beautiful. in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm in San Francisco against my will. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I was like, okay, I need to undo every decision I made in the past year. <laughs> and so uh, it, it's, it's much harder to leave a job as a, as a manager uh, because you essentially need to take care of your people and then you also need to let the founders know, mm-hmm. but then also make sure that you don't screw up the company in the process of leaving. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a, a bunch of major projects along the, on the way that um, I had to, to hand off. So it basically took me like three months to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it gives you a bit of time to hire a replacement, which we still haven't hired, uh, and, uh, and 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 basically like make sure that each of your employees are, are well taken care of. That's the most important thing in my mind. Especially I, I was responsible for hiring some of them, right? Mm-hmm. And then just piecing out of people was just not nice. Um, okay, and then um, I also was by myself, and I have heard that it is standard founder advice that you always need a co-founder, right? YC insists on two, on two founders. Um, as in, even for Dropbox, uh, the famous uh, story. Do you know about the Dropbox story? I don't know the co-founder. Um, Arosh. I actually uh, had. I was at. A, I didn't have dinner with them. I, I was at a dinner where they were present. Sure. So I, they don't know who I That counts. But Drew Houston applied to YC as a solo founder, and they were like, "We love you. You're amazing, but we're not going to accept you without a, a co-founder." Hmm. So he like looked around, looked for the first Indian fella he could find. I see. Yes. And like he, they are not. He's been his CTO for fifteen years. <laughs> That's a, I did not know the story. That's amazing. But good choice. I respect it. Man's gonna become CEO one day. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, he got super lucky. Yeah. Mm. Um, so I was like, okay, I need a co-founder. Uh, I am not the best coder, right? Mm. Uh, I have never said. I've never presented myself to the best coder. I am a good writer. Uh, so I was like, okay, and. Let's say I know marketing and products or front end. I need a back end infrastructure or ML person. Right. Like that. Ideally, that would be my complement. So I was like, okay, put up the search. Like my network is supposed to be good, but my network is all JavaScript people and, yeah. and like you know, kind of useless in this context. And so then like a bunch of VCs were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll be happy to help you go on a date. Uh, and that kicked off a very, very, very painful uh, two month process of. Uh, pairing up with, with, with uh, a couple of people and, and eventually deciding that it didn't work. So, so l- yeah. let's dive into that for a bit. Okay. We are both solo founders. Yeah. And I have to tell you, like, I was also worried about this. I started speaking to people thinking I need a co-founder, like some of my closest friends. Uh, but two things like really swayed my decision to a, like, do it as a solo thing. One is, it turns out I could actually build the end to anything by myself and pitch it and sell it. Like I feel like at least I have like a spread of skills. I'm a social dude, etc. But I'm also technically oriented. But second, there are so many in the last five years. I have seen so many startups fall apart uh, simply because uh, the co-founders didn't uh, the founders didn't get along. Like something breaks the relationship and it's always messy. Uh, and I thought it might have been just uh, like frequency illusion, like I was just seeing it because I can't unsee it. But no, it turns out then that uh, after speaking to a whole bunch of PCs and other this thing, it's a thing. Like I think other than like lack of product market fit or whatever, the biggest reason why startups fail right now is because founders don't get along. So 
uh, there's that. B, it's 2023. The reason that you would need a co-founder, you can actually augment in another place. That there's community which is way deeper and friendlier and more accessible to everyone now. Um, uh, you don't really feel alone if you're surrounded, uh, if you have, again, like if you have like co-working spaces, but people that you work with, people you can bounce ideas off. Uh, and specifically for people like you and me, like we are people on like speed dial that we can talk to about any part of the business or the technology chain or any ideas that you have. Uh, so what exactly would a co-founder bring to you other than the, oh, people have told me that it's a thing that I need to do. Like, well, so I think, don't get me wrong, it might not be the thing for everyone, but at yeah. least for people like you and me, it turns out that it might have been the right thing after all. Uh, yeah, well, uh, so I'm not like 1000% there yet, right? Mm. Um, there, I, I've actually studied quite a few founder stories. Um, I think it was like something like this. Don't, don't, I'm not, I'm going to be fuzzy on the exact details, sure. but I think Mike Krieger started Instagram and was solo for six months before he found uh, whoever the other guy is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he was co-founder, right? Like, uh, so for me, it was just more, I decided to be solo because I couldn't wait anymore. I couldn't wait to... Well, the entire industry changes in six months. Exactly. Period. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and if someone owns small models first before me, then I would have lost my idea. Then yeah. I need a different idea. Yeah. yeah. You know? um, so I just couldn't wait. Uh, but I, I'm, I, I am still currently uh, looking for a, a co-founder just in case someone comes along that is amazing. Does it have to be co-founder, co-founder? Or are you just no. looking for partners in the journey? Yeah. That's awesome. That, that you should do yeah. anyway. Yes. Yeah, but um, I, I do think that like co-founders, uh, you know, uh, like co-founders help to load balance, right? There, mm. There's some things that I know I'm very weak at, and so if I can someone, if I can find someone who complements that that parts of parts of me, um, then I can just offload everything to, to that person. That's really great. Um, and then it's not just about you. You always have. Uh, so you have a wife. I don't have anyone. Right. Um, you, I'm sure you run a lot of things by her. Oh, hundred percent. She's right? she's sick of it at this point. Somebody that you just completely trust that is not you that uh, will give you critical feedback that has one that is like equally vested in the business. Right? Sure. She's vested by marriage. For me, I have to vest with. That's with actually solid else. insight. You're right. I do have. <laughs> in fact, I was just thinking about this. Uh, it is so hard to get honest feedback. Uh, in this world, I think, anymore, especially in technology. Like you consider Twitter, right? Like uh, there is a lot of bad tech out there, but it is impossible to give feedback on it without it being misconstrued or like actually not yeah. like uh, no nuance, no context. So people are just afraid to give feedback to each other. So yeah, I, uh, you live in San Francisco now, though. Do you still not have that kind of uh, even like in parts? I have you met, feedback? so you might met crew now. I have met your crew. Uh, I I tweeted before about how lucky I feel to be part of this crew. Uh, so it is my like self hand rolled YC, right? Because all founder like that car that we just ride, all mm -hmm. all four CEO, CEOs, right? Like yeah, and, yeah. Oh, that's and, right. And, yeah, all four and, CEOs. And, uh, so uh, you know, uh, Joseph is D stage, uh, Matter is C, uh, A C and A, and then mm -hmm. where we just started. Um, so so yeah, it's, it's just really great to have that. And actually, I uh, uh, actually thought of starting like a small like solo founder community. Like we're only solo founders, mm -hmm. all sharing problems of solo founders, Do right? It. You know, I think I think that would be cool. But I need to stop doing this community shit. Things. I need to start writing software, building the company, <laughs> the actual company. That's <laughs> okay. So so uh, maybe that brings you up to speed to to like maybe company formation, and then we'll talk about small developer because mm -hmm. this is a chronological order. Yeah. So after the co-founder thing fell apart, I uh, went to Miami to. Celebrate my birthday. Yay! Uh, I was there. That's and awesome. Going to react by me. <laughs> Not in that order. Uh, and then I was like, okay, you know, um, I have so many good friends. Like, I, I have your your encouragements. Uh, I have VCs waiting. Uh, I should just do this. Uh, I clicked the strike button uh, on the flight home, uh, and, uh, and 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 basically, you know, started pursuing that as a as a solo idea. Um, I had people that I knew who were already like kind of sold on the idea. So the, the base idea is essentially that we would, based on your production traffic to OpenAI, we would sort of man in the middle it with Cloudflare workers, but then also uh, train a shadow model on the inputs and outputs that would be much smaller and eventually replace it. 
Um, so that uh, for me, the magical moment would be that you would wake up one day and uh, we would just have an email from Small AI saying, hey, your uh, AI API costs are 15% lower. You didn't have to change anything. Cheers. Love it. Right? Uh, I really like, of all the things I learned from React, the number one thing I learned from Seb, do you call him Seb or Seb Sebastian? I say Seb. Sometimes I say Sebastian when talking to other people, but <laughs> on the team, everyone used to call him Seb. So yeah. uh, is he, he had this talk in 2014 or 2015 uh, on uh, Small API, Small API surface, surface area, right? That's You've right. seen it, I've seen it, Beautiful because we're, we're like obsessed with like API design and, mm -hmm. and React philosophy. Uh, and React is super freaking small API surface area, which caused the huge ecosystem of libraries. Um, but uh, I was like, what is the smallest API surface area I can possibly do? It's actually Cloudflare. Cloudflare, with the promise of you switch over to DNS, right? You get caching, you get DDoS protection, you get uh, all, these, all these other benefits. And I was like, what is the Cloudflare experience for AI? Uh, so basically, uh, Small AI was sort of pitched as essentially um, Cloudflare for props. It's, 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 a, it's a very simple quotidian uh, way of, of pitching that. Uh, and so basically, I, I have one guy in production with me right now. Mm -hmm. uh, he hasn't not paying yet, but uh, he has promised to pay whenever I ask. I haven't asked, just that uh, my service sucks right now. <laughs> no, that, that's good. That's the uh, nice thing about being on the startups program as well, where it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll yeah, figure yeah. it out one day. It's good. Uh, so, alongside with the, deciding to start the company, um, I did want funding because I, I do have significant infrastructure costs, most of which goes to OpenAI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I also wanted to like pay for equipment and like hire people. I did also want to sponsor the visa of one potential employee. Mm -hmm. So all that you need money. Right, and uh, so fortunately for me, uh, Alessio has been a partner in pod on, on the podcast, the newsletter, uh, for a, a few months now, uh, and is, was just fully able to, to write a pre-seed check. Uh, and I just ended up not pitching anybody. I just had, so you talked to like 60 people, yeah. 60 VCs, yeah. talked to one. one. <laughs> and, and well, you spoke to one of the best ones. Yeah, yeah, Alessio is great. great. Yeah, I got, I got Alessio really and are yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah. there is that. Uh, I also have a small check, smaller check from Alana, uh, which I don't know if you've met her, but uh, she's also really, really cool. And, mm -hmm. and her network is great. Um, I respect the founders that she's uh, invested in, and so I was very lucky to be one of them. Uh, and yeah, so that so that was the the funding story. Less exciting than you, you know. I didn't have like people fighting over me. I had uh, had a few term sheets. Yeah. Is what it is. Yeah, it was it escalated so quickly. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, okay, so we're not talking about who you went with, uh, but at some point, at some future point down the road, we will. Mm. Uh, because I also think that that decision factor is also very interesting, and it's something that I will face at some point in the future. Of uh, choice of partner? Yes. I, uh, for... Uh, we don't have to talk about it now. No, no, no. I, 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 I don't have to go into the specifics of the names, but uh, mm. things will come to light anyway at some point. Uh, and I've been thinking about it, why I did the thing I did. So I went with a much bigger firm. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people told me, well, aren't you worried about signaling risk and so on and so forth. It's the dumbest fucking shit I've ever fucking heard. I, I swear to you. Uh, somebody basically sat me down and said, why are you preparing for so much failure? Like, why would you plan? What? For... No, 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 in a good way. Like, why do you care? Like, just go with them. They're such great partners. Oh. Like, you shouldn't think about what happens if they choose not to invest in your next round. Got it. That's what they said. And I was like, oh shit, that's right. And that like, <laughs> like that was the like 10 second flip of, a, okay, fine. If I'm really doing this for the long term, I need long term partners. Yeah. I need the resources. I need the network, etc. What a great partner. How lucky am I that they actually want to be a part of this journey with me. Uh, so that actually made like some of the decisions a lot simpler. But uh, I'm building an infrastructure company. By the way, trying to build a non-AI infrastructure company in 2023 is wild. Very non-consensus. Yeah. Uh, but I enjoy but, it. But I think, I mean, also, I mean, I can make the other pitch that, hey, uh, Adobe just bought Figma for $20 billion. Like, making the sort of, we, we, we turn you into a Figma company seems like a good idea. <laughs> I think so. I think so. It's not too bad. Uh, I think also that one of the things that happened, this is a little more personal, but I discovered an ambition that wasn't like just only central to me. There's ambition, like there's personal ambition. Oh, I want to be, uh, I want I want to have a lot of impact on the industry. I want to build something big, etc. But I think the insight I've actually had with building this thing is that uh, collaborative real-time tech is kind of the future. That's A, and B, that collaboration is actually a spectrum. 
like not every form of collaboration is everybody on the same document typing at the same time or drawing at the same time. Uh, uh, there's there are multiple like GitHub is collaboration, email is email is sort of collaboration. Uh, more importantly, the workflows collaboration basically manifests itself in a, uh, in workflows. So you write a draft, your editor sees it, makes suggestions, you accept it, etc. Google Docs has a suggestion mode for this. Uh, GitHub does it with PRs, etc. Uh, and there is a spectrum of collaboration to be explored, and it feels like parties, as in party kit, the party kit party is. Uh, I still like the name. Do you, do you do you call it rooms or parties? Uh, I call them rooms. Uh, the, the instances parties. are rooms. Huh? I should just call it parties, right? I've been I've been calling the bigger entity parties, but I should just call the rooms. Oh, they're branding, as well. man. man. Branding is so key. Okay, party. Okay, we'll no. talk about branding later. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, I think <laughs> it it is. The insight I suddenly had was that A, it's a fundamentally new novel primitive. Mm -hmm. that it, it's not implemented in user space. This has otherwise like actor model, any real time system like this has been implemented with readers instances across the world. And you're like, no, this is actually available in the infrastructure as, as a thing. Yeah. Uh, and suddenly it, make, it makes, it takes the tech from being a hard distributed systems problem to accessible to fucking weekend hackers. Yeah. People can get something work, not just can they get it working over a weekend, but it can be production ready over the weekend. Yeah. Which means now there's, it's that thing where something new suddenly expands and becomes like bigger. Like for me, I, I can't help but look at AI agent driven applications and say, oh, that fits so well with PartyKit. There yeah. are entities and there are uh, humans and uh, cybernetic inputs and outputs through everything. Oh shit, how else do you model this? If you're talking about the React thing, the thing that I really liked about React was the way that you otherwise do some form of inter rough interface design is two people stand in front of a whiteboard and they start drawing rectangles, mm. right? Header, sidebar, right? Yeah. But more interestingly is you can take every one of those React terms and point it to a react.create class. Well, at the time it was create <laughs> class, right? Uh, and that's, it, it like translated one is to one. So now if you try to do system architecture diagrams, you know, specifically real time, but anything else, what you do is you draw circles and you draw arrows between them. What file or module does each of the circles connect to? That is not clear right now and suddenly with PartyKit it is literally a .ts file. So there is now, there's the ambition of, oh shit, I want to have impact, but suddenly the ambition of the, the company and the technology where I'm like, oh shit, I, if, if done right, everybody will be building applications like this. There is just no, there's no going back from it. Once you start seeing it, you can't unsee it. You're like, Okay, it has to exist, uh, which is why I need partners uh, in terms of VC, in terms of angels. Uh, it's why I need the money because there are friends that I love and respect more, like respect the hell out of their work. And I have to go up to them and say, hey, how would you like to do more work for less money? And they're <laughs> like, yeah, let's do it. I'm like, oh shit, that worked. Uh, and there's a journey, like it's going to take time to like build out everything. Uh, it would be very easy for me to say, you know what, it's very easy to do CRDTs as a service and a bunch of players do that and they make some money, that's fair. But suddenly the ambition of the thing is, oh shit, computing is actually heading in this direction. Uh, there's, they're just going to be systems talking to each other. It's not just going to be pull based request response stuff. It's going to be push based systems, like just fundamentally up everywhere, every device. Mm. And a company like PartyKit is going to take a shot at it. It's why I think also other people haven't attempted the same model. Like I look around, I'm like, why is why does this not exist yet? Uh, okay. Have you looked at so do you identify Party Kit as enabling actors actor model? Hundred percent. Okay. Have you looked at Microsoft Orleans? No. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this is where I also have a little bit of history because of Temporal, right? Yeah. Temporal has taught me so much about like <laughs> uh, backend orchestration, actor model, workflows databases and Kubernetes a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, mean, I would, uh, this Microsoft is not a, this, yeah, check it out. Uh, it powers uh, Halo, uh, the multiplayer in Halo. Mm -hmm. uh, so very high performance, very battle tested. Mm -hmm. And in, it, unfortunately it's in C sharp, so you have to read the code. But C sharp, you, you probably could. I've actually, I was an officer, so I actually put in some C sharp there. Yeah, yeah. Nice language, actually, not too bad. And a big part of Temporal was why we are not agents. Uh, sorry, why we are not actor actor model. Uh -huh. So uh, we have a blog post about that. Uh, the guy who created Orleans, who defected from Orleans to Temporal, wrote that. Uh, uh, Sergey. 
Control. Right. It's very, very nice. Right. I actually... Uh, the durable functions. One of the... No, that, that is, uh, that is uh, Maximum Saban. Oh, okay. The founder okay, okay. is... Uh, Sergey is, I think, a principal engineer. Oh, wait, wait. So what was the uh, what was the point against that? I don't remember. <laughs> I'll check it. I'll read the blog post. Yeah, it was it was something like um, actor model was very much um, n- like disorganized or or um, you know because every every actor is talking to every other actor. Uh, you don't have a central orchestration system to coordinate the like when things can do can progress together. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why you don't want to build business workflow engines with actor model. I, I, yes. I, I, I'll, I'll look into the blog post, but I think yes. I know what you're referencing. No, yeah. but like, the, the, so for me it was a big deal because like this, this is the freaking audience guy coming over and saying, oh, uh, yeah, actor is uh, over. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, it was a, definitely a little bit uh, chosen to be controversial as a title, but he genuinely believes that, and I thought it came from uh, you know 10, 15 years of deep experience with this stuff. So. I would, I would encourage you to look into that. But yes, uh, you know, coming back to the AI agents thing, that's why you registered partykit.ai. That's why I have partykit.ai. Uh, but you, you're, not, you, you're not doing anything yet, right? You're just kind of sitting on it. I, like, listen, man. What? I wake up every day uh, and I have to force myself not yeah, yeah, to do yeah, an yeah, yeah. AI project. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, this is the most interesting thing on the planet, it's but like, I have you, a product You can, you can load on me. And then yeah, but I'm like, hey, man, what you working on, man, Sean? Like, hey, tell me what's going on. Um, it's the most interesting thing, and I'm like, no, I have a product, I have a thing to ship. Like, okay, let me get that out there and then build on this. But I actually do, I have a couple of design partners who worked on the idea. Okay. Um, Verb.ai, this is the yeah. AI assisted <laughs> fiction writing software yeah. thing. Uh, they experimented with how do you do the human, uh, this thing, collaboration using PartyKit. I don't think they ever shipped it. I don't think they will ever ship it. Uh, uh, but it was interesting to see that, uh, that like I just ended up having a bunch of conversations with uh, Yanni on it. And uh, I think it has some, I think there's definitely something there, but man, like there's just so much work to make it like accessible and start convincing people to even use it, etc. Which is what I sort of do now all the time. Like anyone asks, like anyone breathes in my direction and says, hey, what's party kit? I immediately go into like, hey, you want to see a demo? Can I show you a demo? Yeah, and you just pull up your job. Exactly. You need to be that. pulling up your landing page. I know. Okay. Which has a multiplayer thing. You can invent your job if you want. Well, what I do is, uh, I want to be pulling up uh, small.ai is the next Yes, demo. yes. Uh, hey, you want to see yeah, the, yeah. an AI driven thing that yeah, exactly. other people use? Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, I actually have a, a designer that I really like uh, working on that right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be chicks. And then, so every user is a chick, and then you can kind of run around, and maybe you sort of prompt them to do something, and they will do it. Um, yes, please. <laughs> but I also, I love the, like, my most magical UX experience was with Steve on the Tiojo Canvas app, and, and uh, I really want to replicate that feeling without the Nazis <laughs> and, the, and the penises. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see what that happens, because I really like that, hey, like, hey, we're on this same page together on the web. It's... And... I mean, yeah. the thing that, un- uh, uh, like, again, one of those things that uh, once you see, you can't unsee, is that this has been the dream of the internet ever since it sort of started. Yeah. Like, everyone was like, real time is coming, real time is coming, multi is coming, multi is coming. But it ended up, ended up being only multi billion dollar mm-hmm. companies who could build Google Docs, Figma, Triple A Game Studios. And suddenly, like, the physics of that thing is like, it's just, like, it got unlocked yesterday, while well, now everyone has to start using it. So. Yesterday, you mean? Oh, uh, I just mean uh, conceptually yesterday, not, okay, not, yeah. not metaphorically, yeah, not, not 24 hours. No, I thought, I thought you were talking about uh, D11. You know, oh, D1? No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah. no, no. Well, their, their marketing poster is that this is D11 uh, because we turned D1 up to, yeah, up to 11. Oh my God. I loved it. It was great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I dig it. I, okay, I dig it. I dig it. The thing is that the whole point of naming it D1 was they have R2. Yes. And the hope was that once they shipped their distributed database, it would be called D2. So it would be R2D2. Uh, okay, and then what happened? Well, clearly they said D11. No, it's still D1. Were they upgraded at some point to D2? I don't know. I think that's the plan. Oh, by the way, when I say it's the plan, I mean, in a, hey, like when we do something cooler yeah, than yeah. this, we'll call it you know why is You know why it's R2, right? Yes, because it's uh, one character less than S3. Yeah. Yes. Uh, also, they just shipped a product called C3, by the way. I didn't know that. Uh, it's uh, Create Cloudflare CLI. Oh, yeah, hey man, like they didn't. That, I had nothing to do with that one. Well, so okay, I have two responses to that. 
One, there's a company called C3.ai. Yeah. It's actually like a $4 billion enterprise AI company. You go onto the landing page, landing page you have no idea what it does. That's how enterprise it is. Oh, you shit. You must be making a fuck ton of money. I imagine so. <laughs> if they're like, you, you just said $4 billion, right? With a B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But... Uh, if you drive on the, 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 the freeway, you'll see their banners. That, and it's and like, you still AI is for everyone. Thing. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> and then the other the other uh, uh, comment that I had, uh, I, I forget. Oh, a uh, small developer is supposed to kill all create X apps. Oh, let's talk about small developer yeah, for okay. a bit. So yeah. So, yeah. so uh, got the funding done. Um, got my first design class customer, and then like I was happily doing that in production. In, and that was my original path. And then um, you know, in the back of my mind, I've always been influenced by what I see around me and like rethinking things from first principles. I spent a couple of months, uh, I'm an early investor in Chroma, Chroma mm-hmm. um, also another super hot round this year. Um, and uh, I, I, I advised them for their dev round stuff for a few months. And they raised $18 million uh, from Estasia, that did all this is public, um, which is absurd because they have four people. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Great team, the water team. <laughs> Oh, you know, you've read them? I just follow them on Twitter. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah, cool guys. Um, and then, so the first, you know, the first thing that they turn around to do with their with the money is to hire. And like Jeff, you know, a good friend of mine, uh, CEO, uh, is spending vast majority of the time, his time hiring. And I'm like, yeah, that's great, but that's like kind of what pre-AI companies do. And I'm like, what, what would be like the AI yeah, native version of that would be? Which is like all, all of you MFs need to be building your own AI assistants to help you in your daily tasks. Yeah. Uh, and so for him, it would be like, hey, build an AI recruiter to source candidates, right? Mm-hmm. Look, look through all LinkedIn, like, what are, where are your criteria? Do we fit? Do we fit? I'll build, build this. That's sourcing. And he pays people for that. And I'm like, you should automate this and use Chroma to do it, uh, to, to dog food, mm-hmm. right? And to make yourself more efficient. But then for me, it's like, I, I'm not recruiting yet. Um, but I, I really care about being more efficient with my my goal. Uh, part of the values of small uh, AI is, is which I, which I kind of drew up in, in a notion uh, when working with other co-founders was that we will be will hire twice as slow as any other company, and we will offer twice as much to each, right? Intentionally, so small team. Oh, that makes you a forex company. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, Half the size, twice the value. Yeah, That's sure, sure. I, 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 yeah. Okay. okay. Um, and then, uh, and so, so basically, I was like, okay, someone has to have made this, and I, I'm, fam- I'm familiar with all the tools out there. All the GPT is is, is very hot. Um, I also studied baby AI, and I'm friends with uh, Bashek Kid, Tomas. Actually, I'm a small investor in them for E2B, which is English to bits, horrible mm-hmm. name, but uh, great co-founder pair. Um, and I was like, okay, like, but I looked at all these tools, and I'm like, this doesn't really do what I want. And just go from prompt to app. Um, and, and not full app, just scaffold, which is really like the the, the, the vision of, of, of me. And I have I have contributed to Create React app, I've used Create Next.js app, I, I, and, and all these other starter kits, right? Yeoman. Swell kit, I thought you were going to say, but yeah. Swell kit as well. Yeoman still is a wrong yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. None of these software ever dies. Yeah. Uh, so, but like all these are like manually maintained. You need to like have the template, and you need to like figure out all the templating things. And then if, if you have any needs that are not in the template, so, it's kind of screwed. So yeah. like Swellkit, like uh, Rich Harris doesn't like tailwinds. So none of the, t- the Swellkit thing have tailwind in it. Mm-hmm. And you always have to like. I mean, it, it, uh, he's wrong. Uh, <laughs> but sure, yeah. Um, he recently tried it, by the way. I think I think he's like coming around. Oh, okay. Anyway, so I'm like, what what would it take for a create anything app? Right, and so I started with a, a little prompts and then like a, you know generate, generate some files and it was like okay kind of works, and um, and then I spent twenty four hours working on it until I had a working app and so the the the, the app for me was a Chrome extension. Um, I have I always love Chrome extensions because they enhance an existing website. It is user scripts yeah. and user computing, but it is too hard to make Chrome extensions. It is so hard uh, because you have to like get all these needed details right and all the advice out there is for Chrome Manifest V2 which is now not accepted by Chrome. That's you right. You have to switch to V3 and the docs suck. Yeah. I don't, you've tried this. And uh, they fired half the, uh, half the team. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. Simeon is uh, I think uh, still out there. Simeon was the, the one developer yeah, yeah. for Chrome extensions. Um, 
So I was like, I don't want to do any of this again. It's so stupid. Uh, so uh, and, and and the Chrome extension was specifically for using Anthropic's one hundred thousand context window. Yeah. Uh, API, which I had access to because I interviewed at Anthropic. Um, the fun fact: you want to get in, uh, get access to APIs. You interview for them, ask for it, and they they just give it to you and take not remove from the feature flag. That's yeah. not. Yeah. <laughs> which is great. <laughs> yeah, it works. Uh, so so. So, but like now, let's say I wanted a universal summary as a Chrome extension, right? Because I can throw in anything. Uh, 100,000 uh, context window is, is about 200 pages. Beautiful. Right? You can throw anything, right? Yeah. Any, any yeah. blog post, you can kind of throw it in there and summarize for you. Um, but I didn't want to build the extension. So I built the thing that built the extension, right? And, and I, think in, I think that is a really good design philosophy for developer tools people, which is instead of like when you solve a problem, try to solve it in a more general fashion that is reusable for multiple use cases. And, and so for me, that was small developer as a uh, prompting tool. I prototyped it against it uh, within 24 hours. And then at the end, I had this kind of working Chrome extension from a very large prompt, um, recorded a video, and I was like, you know, this is a, I, I've seen Object GPT is way more impressive. I've seen so many other ideas of this. I'm going to tweet it out on Sunday night, yeah. which is dead zone for Twitter, right? Like yeah. nothing happens on, on Twitter on Sunday night. Uh, and then immediately caught fire. And then uh, like, Within a day, it was like a thousand stars, and then it just kept. Uh, and then it was like Hacker News number one for like something like fourteen hours. Um, and then it, no, it went up twice, right? It went twice onto Hacker News for some reason. Uh, I posted it. I posted it as a show HN, yeah. and, it, and it didn't get anywhere. Okay. And then and then someone else posted it, and it went up to, to, to number one. Um, and then the third day was GitHub trending uh, number three. That's right. Uh, the thing that you saw twice was uh, I had another repo and, and another thing I was using, uh, my small menu bar app. Yeah. Which uh, AB tests um, one prompt to all chat apps, but as web views, so you get the, the, the exact app. There's you're not using API, you're using sure. the full thing. So you have all the features, including ChatGPT plugins and uh, Bard's uh, surfing, and then oh the awesome, topics, okay, right, right. topics um, uh, outputs, uh, whatever else other features. But you just get the full features mm. uh, the day that they they ship, right? And there's no um, distance between that. Um, so that one also was on the GitHub trending list. <laughs> so it was like me and then me again. Uh, so that was a pretty pretty fun day. Um, so so yeah, that, that was the past week. Um, I haven't really done anything much to it. Uh, I do think that there's How there many stars are you at right now? On small seven, seven and a half. Yeah. Um, um, Chroma is at five point five. <laughs> so I so I tweeted uh, uh, Jeff. I was like, can I have eighteen million dollars? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess it's time to raise your proper seed now. That's what you should do. Um, but I don't, I don't need the money. I have money, you know. So, I get it. so yeah. Actually, I, I so we'll talk about money uh, a, a slightly bit later. But uh, just to finish out the small developer story, um, yeah. I, I mean, so that there's this a a side project that got out of control. That now people think, oh, you're working on developer agent, ooh, right? But like, it's open source. It's not monetizable in any way. I don't fully believe that it is like a product or like a business. So you don't have a thesis on it, like you did. I just did it for myself. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, and so, do I? So the, the the primary thing I've been wrestling with for the past week is do I double down on this thing? I I got a lottery ticket. A lot of attention. A lot of people looking at it. Uh, do I do I double down and become the Nicola GPT? Mm. Right, that is the focus of developers and like build a developer tooling company. Or do I do I say, okay, um, stick to the original plan, this is a fun distraction for a week, let's get back to work. Mm. Right? Uh, those both paths are open for me and my two investors, one each on each side. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> well I assume Alessio still wants small models. <laughs> yes. Okay. I uh but both of them are smart. Both of them have, have seen, uh, you know. So, so, uh, and so it's always come down to me. Like, what do I want? Right? Like it's, it's the end of the day. Actually, it's, a, it's actually a very good. It is a very specific question because both tools, outside of you, yeah. uh, both ideas deserve to exist. Yes. Of course, there should be something that yes. spits out boilerplate for an app, etc., and enables millions yes. of developers. Here. Of course, there should be small use case driven models. Uh, this thing. Um, so, what do you like? What What do you want to do? Exactly. exactly. So, so uh, I, I mean, I think there is a way to thread the needle. 
uh, or in other words, have my cake and eat it too, mm. by uh, essentially small developer being my next JS open source thing, but then you look for problems that you can solve at the infrastructure layer, right. and then you build the infrastructure layer while funding open source because uh, it's very popular. Sure. Right? Uh, so if I want to be the Marcel of AI, maybe. Sure. Uh, maybe a hot take, but like, I'm not the biggest fan of the way that Vercel, you know, does everything. I'm a big fan of like some things. That, uh, a lot of people, a fan of the you know some things, but like, uh, I don't know if I want to be them. That's all. Right? They do a lot. They do they a have lot. just got, like, they've gotten out to this. Well, that was always their plan. Uh, Vercel always wanted to become the. Oh, I, I don't want to use the word opinionated here because it's actually fairly uh, broad in how you can configure it. Uh, but they wanted to be the end-to-end -to -end developer tool chain, like from yeah. uh, setting up the project all the way to deploying analytics yes. and then like spinning it back in. So yes. I don't so, think they had a strategy where they couldn't become what they are, have become right now. Yeah, I, I told, uh, yeah, when they raised their Series C or D, uh, Guillermo started saying things like, uh, we'll be the SDK for the web. And I was like, what the fuck does that mean? Like, the web has APIs, we don't need SDKs. Yeah. Uh, and, then I, and then I got it after they like, Started investing in SWC and like Turbo Pack, and, right. like, and then uh, and then when Rich Harris joined, uh, he was like, "What? You know?" And so I had to explain all this to him. Uh, so I, I like it. I like it. I, but I it's not for you. Things positive. Um, maybe. Like I don't know. Like I, I it, it's complicated feelings because obviously like we all have friends there and uh, it's a very successful company. So like you will be so lucky to replicate their success. Uh, and and the people who like opt into Versailles World. They're taken care of. Yeah, pretty no. much. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, you know, maybe not the best for like non Vercel React people, who uh, who have been left out in the cold. You know. There are two separate things uh, to dive into here. By the way, I want to ask you, like, how long do you want to do this? I as, long long as, want, as long as you want, man. Okay, so if we run out of steam, we'll just run. Uh, so there are two things that I've been thinking about. It's, uh, I, I should, you know, uh, spe specifically with like the Versal thing, but also with like Parikin. Um, I've started writing down a document about what I think the company's values are. Yes. <laughs> and the reason to do that is when I'm faced with hard questions, yeah. I can ask the values. Yeah. Does it align with the values or not? And I don't mean values as if we are a fun little family company. Uh, we are, I, I refuse to use the word family with uh, my company, but yes. like, please so have your own team. values. Yes. Sports team is good. Um, you know where that comes from, right? Netflix. Netflix, you started the sports team analogy. Yes. Oh, should I do that? Okay. Uh, that's and, a good one. And they have a culture doc, which uh, you, I would recommend reading. I have actually, like, yeah. uh, wow, like a while ago. That's an old one. Yeah. But, um, but the values doc, I think, is an important way, a rubric, so to speak, to like answer these questions. Uh, and it's helped me clarify the things that I want to do and the things I don't want to do. Um, so, for example, one of the thing, decisions that I've had to walk back on is, oh, we won't be hosting websites, but the, if the idea is to make real-time computing accessible to everyone, then the first step can't be, hey, spin up a WordCell Netlify district. So I think we're going to do some form of static asset hosting. Might, might not do everything that everyone else does, but hey, man, you want to be able to, say, party kit in it and uh, get a real-time application. Where are you going to do the builds? Probably GitHub Actions. I don't think we are going to run builds by ourselves. Yeah. GitHub Actions, okay. Well, honestly, it should be fast enough to run on your own laptop. That's what I'm doing right now, which is, can you just do something like that? Not within your control. Well, Actions then, what's wrong with Actions? Uh, not the best UX of the XD. So, if you want, let's just say, even the static side support isn't even like super, uh, I'm not going to build too many features into it. If you outgrow the feature set, then you can move to a Vercel Netlify, some, some other build system, etc. In fact, that's what I suspect most people in bigger companies' production, they will already have their own build environments and their own static asset serving CD and whatever. Uh, I can provide this as a, what I want is for you to be able to say party kit in it and uh, get going immediately. I understand. That's, 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 so that's what the values document answers for me. I'm here for making real-time programming accessible to regular people. And if I can't get them started in under a minute, then I'll fail. Um, so I guess you need to write down what the small uh, values are. I have, I have a doc. I don't have them memorized. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you should but, start asking but, these but questions. Small team is, is one. Uh, and, and honestly, like AI first might be, might be another one, right? Like uh, 
try to solve your problems with AI. That's because, such a strong word. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and be, because if you don't, then someone else will, and you will lose out. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I definitely have plans for small C. Uh, actually, small CEO. I would actually like to not be CEO. You know, it'd be so cool to have an AI CEO. Oh, AI CEO. Oh, I should have done. I was about to say, yeah, in six months, I might, but AI CEO is good. Small CEO? Yeah. yeah That's exactly. the next project? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's the next project, but yes, it's already been talked about. My first uh, call, I had a community call for small developer because, you know, that's the playbook after you launch something. Um, someone already suggested small CEO next. And, uh, and he was like, will you work your way up? And I was like, no, actually, CEO is the most automatable job. Yeah. Like one thing you repeat it. Yeah. <laughs> you say like three things. Can you imagine it doing say pitches to investors? Hey, can you book a call with my small CEO uh, and uh, figure out the details? Yeah, yeah. But also like you know, and I have this chip on my shoulder because I have very, very, very good YC friends, uh, Brandon from Tech Control and and uh, Paul from Superbase, and all of them are like YC is amazing. I know you can raise uh, you know at, at whatever valuation. And YC only values you at two million dollars yeah. by the way. Um, deep down the math by least. Uh, it's, it's actually quite low, uh, but it's worth it. YC network is amazing. Yeah. I'm like, my network is pretty strong. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I can replicate uh, all the YC advisors because by like scrubbing their public statements right. and do small YC, right? And then it's just like Ooh, little little YC versions of like uh, Michael Siebel and like you know Dalton Caldwell and Dora Chung and all, like, I know all these people because I've read, listened to everything that they've ever said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do I need them? No. <laughs> Actually, I'm surprised they haven't uh, done this yeah. by themselves yet, yeah, yeah. so that they can scale YC batches to like <laughs> thousands of people, right? Like, yeah, just uh, I plug in my uh, little CEO yeah, yeah. Yeah. talking head yeah. uh, to the model. Yeah, but uh, on, a, on a more serious note, uh, I do need this because I am uh, much more of an impulsive, in, inspire, inspiration-driven person. Uh, so I, I'm not. I need to keep myself accountable, mm -hmm. and I can't really share it with. I can't really share some of these details with anyone other than. A therapist maybe, and I haven't found a therapist that I trust, hmm. uh, or a bot. Uh, <laughs> so I might as well make my own bot that is small YC, that is like, hey, uh, what would Dalton Caldwell say? Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I dig it. Yeah, um, okay, so I feel like this is a tangent. Um, the second which, thing that I was thinking about, yes. the first one is this about is regarding values, values and for some, okay. Uh, the second one is dev to developer companies, I'm starting to see a pattern amongst a number of them. Versal, I think, is actually doing fairly well in this, but a number of them aren't. But they spend year one, maybe year two, capturing the hearts and minds of developers, mm. and then they start moving towards revenue, and mm. they leave all these people behind. Mm. And it's like a bit of a bad taste, mm. not just outside the company, but inside the company as well. Yeah. Like People start getting pissed off, saying, well, this kind of goes against our values, are we this kind of company? And management is like, well, it's 2023, we fucking need revenue and we're yeah, starting. We raised $40 million. Right? Now you yeah. need to like pay the uh, pay them back and uh, how do, we won't be able to do the next raise unless we show traction in these two metrics. So the only way to raise those metrics is to go after enterprise, which is a whole other type of thing. Yes. Uh, I don't have, I haven't finished this thought yet. I think like I've been thinking about it and like trying to, like now I have the examples in my head. And I think one of those, of the one obvious answer to this is well, when you form the company, you have to be conscious about the fact that you're building a business and you should probably start focusing on it. You might not be generating revenue on day one and you still probably have to go after developers, but don't fool yourself or other people by saying things are so amazing. We have money in the bank and we'll throw it at open source. If you're building a business, if you're building a venture backed business, there is a responsibility to the company, to yourself. And it's not like you work for your investors, but that is the it's a good motivation to have, right? Like, yeah, fine, let me see how I can 100x this investment in however long. Um, so, I, like I said, I haven't finished with the thought yet, but it seems like you're also at this point where you're starting, you have to make hard decisions. Uh, in my head, by the way, uh, I, I feel like there's clearly a way to unify those two choices into yes. one. Yeah. I, so, I, and I'm pretty sure you'll figure out the actual shape and color of that solution fairly soon. Trying. Uh, but, yeah, the fact that you're a solo founder means that you kind of have to sit with your own thoughts and kind of figure yes. it out. I have you started talking about it with your network, with your with your people, your squad. Uh, uh, a little bit. Um, yeah. The the other founders are like just go with the traction. 
because the other stuff can wait. Yeah, it's such a sad, right, good thing to say. Write right. it until you know if it, if it changes, the other stuff is still there waiting for you. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that there's something to that, which is why I am choosing to spend more time on small developer. Mm. Uh, but yes, there, there's also ways to thread the needle such that um, you solve it in a sort of framework agnostic way. If you regard small developer and all the GPT and Big DJI and uh, you know whatever else comes next as frameworks, you solve things in a framework agnostic way while mm. building a popular framework yourself. Um, yeah, I think that. So so okay, uh, just to like preview a little bit. Um, uh, I wanted endpoint. So one, the, the first issue that anyone outside of me raised on small developer was uh, they ran into context limit issues. Like it's a hard error, uh, four thousand context. You know, uh, uh, you you need to bring in line chains. And so I don't. I have never liked any of those. I, I think line chain is useful for. Uh, it's, it's a, a lot of people have called it, especially jQuery. Uh, it's a it's a collection of tools that is well curated by a central person. Uh, what's the jQuery guy? Uh, you it's Resic. I think John Resic. Resic. Yeah. So Harrison Chase is the John Resic of our times. So. Yeah. And so it's great. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, you shouldn't have to bring in a, a thing just to do a very, 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 very common thing. And uh, basically, context length anxiety pervades all of us, including the other GPT team that we just uh, saw earlier today. So I'm like, what would it take to like create an infinite context endpoint? They just you never worry about it again. The one trade-off is it might be slow. Sure. But that's a trade-off that should exist for yeah. people to choose. Yeah. Uh, sometimes slow is not good, but sometimes I just don't want to worry about context and take however long you want. I don't care. Yeah. Uh. So yeah, a, a line design for that, right? Uh, and that that'll be a that'll be an interesting uh, use case. Um, I also am working on planning. So one of the other issues, the I'm basically one shotting. Uh, the app that I'm making, mm-hmm. but actually you need a planning node. Uh, I, I wrote a blog post about um, why agents are qualitatively different from all the other components, of, uh, all the other advancements in the AI stack, and uh, it is actually happens. It happens to be the one place that GPT-4 sucks at. Like when you when you read the GPT-4 paper, blah blah blah, we're amazing at like law, history, biology, images, whatever. Yeah. Flaws. One flaw: planning. And all the AI agent companies, all uh, or projects are all running straight into this because you cannot plan ahead of time mm-hmm. because the only thing you're doing is is predicting the next token. Yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe I can work on that. So yeah, you know, those are those are framework agnostic things that you, you, if you offer infrastructure that does that, oh my god, everybody will want it, want it, and it's been validated as small developer already. You know what I mean? Okay, I dig it. So, so this is how you thread the needle. Yeah. Okay, um, I can appreciate this. Uh, would be nice to have a team of ten doing this for me. <laughs> well, I, mean, I know, I know. Build the people in I know. Uh, use of space. I know, I know, I know, I know. So, so that's that. Okay, uh, maybe I want to unwind the stack a little bit. Uh, so uh, I'll comment on a couple of things that you that you mentioned, and then we can kind of move on to other topics. Um, you said that you know you have this like mission that you are you want to part you want every everyone to have this like instant experience to make the world collaborative or whatever. What sure. Like, yeah. What's the exact phrasing? Everything's better with friends. No. <laughs> the more corporate one. Uh, <laughs> um, push-based systems are, I feel like, the future of interaction and systems. That's still not it. <laughs> what did I fucking say? Then? You said something about real-time collaboration. Is like me, everyone needs to go quickly to a real-time collaboration uh, as, as 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 easy as possible. Oh else. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if my if my thesis is that Party Kit's mission is to make Yes. Uh, real time. Uh, yeah, if my uh, to make real time computing and collaborative computing accessible to everyone. That's the one. That's the proper one. Yeah. Then in under one minute, you need to be able to get started. Yes. When you put a suit on, that's what. That's the one that you say. Okay. Okay. Know. Good to know. Um, but I think yeah. So uh, when I basically declined the Notion job, mm-hmm. uh, Ivan Jao, the CEO, was like, "Why? You know, Notion's a great company. You all." Yeah. Actually, why, you know, why, that was a question I wanted to ask you as well. Why did you say no? Yeah. Wanted to start a company, yeah. But okay. <laughs> I, I obviously love Notion, and um, have you seen their? You haven't seen their offices yet. No. Best offices in San Francisco. I see. And the people there, so smart, so accomplished. I can do so much more with them than I can do by myself. Mm. Really, you have to be really, really stupid to not join Notion. Um, and so, uh, the my reply to him was like, I think companies are thesis, right? Like, uh, you have a thesis on the world that you want to pursue, and if you don't do it, no one's doing it. 
Um, maybe more true in your case than mine, because I, I do think that mine, somebody will do it. Um, but uh, to join someone else for me uh, is to say that, like, uh, you know, there, there, there's no ideas left in AI. I get it. <laughs> That's a good meta thesis right there. But yeah. Right? Uh, which is why, like, you know, I had a, I had an opportunity to join some, you know, unmentioned other super hot startup in AI, um, and uh, and it was like, why did you why didn't you join? Because I was like, if I join you, you're, you're great, you're amazing. If I do well, if I if I join you, we will make a lot of money together. But uh, it is also me saying that it's nothing else worth pursuing. Um, and like, I think that's a bit of an extreme statement. I think I think uh, I think there's plenty of reasons why you should join a company. Uh, but, but but just for me, like I wanted to give this a shot. You know, I'm 37. Uh, I think it's 39, 39 man. Yeah. Man. Uh, startups is a young person's game. I can get those jobs anytime I want in my 40s. Exactly. So, take a shot. In fact, holy shit! By the way, the the other thing about the founder story, I was so nervous about it when I was starting, but I suddenly realized that all my plan Bs now are fucking amazing. Yeah, I get to be. Uh, I get. I get to choose right after this. Principal engineer at some fucking cutting edge company, like off my choice anywhere in the world, probably remote, uh, as well. So accessible. Probably do second company if I have this thing. Now that I've learned all the things, statistically speaking, I'm going to fail. Like just yeah, just by a numbers game. Yeah. Uh, but that means that my second, if I figure out a way to start a second company, I'll do better at it and like be so much more focused and not do the things I do. Like. I think that's the thing that has given me confidence and I hope you have confidence as well. Like now you're on this journey, you're actually going to enjoy the hell out of it. You have soft landings. We got lucky, I think, by getting into a space where we have soft landings. So I've, I've stopped thinking about failure per se anymore. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, your worst case is it's not that bad. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I, okay. So that's one thing I, I'll, I'll say there. Uh, I, I had some comments on like funding money stuff, but I forgot. Um, yeah, I, I, I think yeah, money, money, money is fine. Uh, okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, interrupt you. No, 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 no. I agree, I agree, I agree with everything that you said. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, wait, the reason I brought it up was, um, you said startups are a young person's game. Yeah. And yeah, like we're not like startup young yeah. anymore. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that that's another thing that's been on my mind. Like I can come up with like a thousand excuses to not do a startup. Uh, but I'll keep those excuses for five years later. I might as well just try it now. Like, hell, man! Like, I'll just yeah. do it. Why not? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, and I think you have, you, you, like, you have a lot of confidence. Uh, what is the source of that? Um, I think age also comes in to play. Like, I've, I've done badly and I've done well at a number of jobs, and I've started noticing patterns about myself. And you're quite public about not doing well at React. Exactly. Like I did, I was there for a year, and I don't. I did one research project on the images and uh, uh, oh, static assets that, thing. Right? Yeah, it's called Frisson. Like I called it Frisson. I hope they keep the name. Uh, that should be out like fairly soon. It like that. That's gonna be good. Yeah. The internal tests that we did in twenty nineteen were so good. Like it made the Facebook web page just like pop. Never shipped to production. Uh, I shipped a testing API over it, but. Um, I didn't really do well on the team at all. Uh, it was a year of like frustration. It was partly my fault, uh, partly team dynamics, whatever. But it, uh, I never actually found my foothold. For like a couple of months in the middle, I thought I had found it. I helped them ship sixty, like sixteen dot nine. I put it together the entire team and helped them do it. Anyway, point being, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, I uh, I now have a thesis about myself. The things, okay. uh, the environment that I like. Uh, the things that will make me fail, the things that I don't, uh, over the last three years. Honestly, the biggest thing that gave me confidence for doing the startup is I fixed my mental and physical health. Mm -hmm. And I recommend that to everyone. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, uh, like my concern with you is I'm not sure your diet is very good right now. No, and sorry. I was like, hey man, maybe you should fix that, yeah. I think. Uh, so many studies about this. And in fact, yeah. like, talk it's to other founders as well. Like thing. sleep, yeah, eight hours sleep, three square meals, 20 minute walk. Uh, that shit will make you more productive than anything else. Oh, and LTNN. That's my magic drug I tell everyone today. <gasps> LTNN, have I not told you? And I have a stage to tell it on. Okay. LTNN is an extract from tea. Okay. Uh, it, uh, it removes the rough edges from caffeine and it gives you focus and it reduces stress and anxiety. And all of these things are problems for me. I went from having, and this is a thing I haven't actually admitted in public. 
Uh, I went from having a panic attack pretty much every two or three weeks to like maybe like twice in a year with LPN and, and the other things, eight hours of sleep, three square meals, 20 minutes walk a day. Uh, it's, you don't need a prescription to take it. It's not, uh, um, it's not a hallucinogen. It doesn't make you high. It's not habit forming. It's just this magical thing. There are like hundreds of papers. It's just a pill. Like Amazon will have like 400 brands or you can buy it like <laughs> off the, uh, over the counter anywhere. Uh, but I researched the hell out of it. I started it. I highly recommend it to you and anyone else watching. Feel free to Google the hell out of it. It's called L T N N D H E A N I N E. Got it. Yeah, I've I've uh, heard of that. I actually didn't know it came from tea. Yeah, it's extracted so, from tea. Yeah. It's uh, which is why like you can. But it's a higher dosage of that, which means that you can have it with like less caffeine. So you get the caffeine uh, focus, but none of the rough edges. No jitters. No nothing. It's yeah. so good. But also in general, it's great for mood and anxiety and stress. Anyway, the, uh, the reason I brought this up is uh, one of the things I worked on over the last three years is fixing that. My mental and physical health and like my relationships with friends, family, everything. Uh, and I developed a thesis on myself, the things I'm good at, the things I'm not good at. Uh, and uh, that gave me so much confidence to do the startup. It's weird. It's I mean the technology is one thing, uh, and I needed TL draw and I needed uh, the patronage of Steve to have the space to be like, yeah, you have something new you want to try, do it here. I was like, oh shit, okay, I'm going to try it, uh, and that gave me the confidence in the technology. But the startup thesis was very much looking into myself and jumping into the London pond three times a week uh, with Yanni. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> when 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 did this romance with Yanni start? Okay, uh, give me one second. Discord is just killing me right now uh okay yeah so when did this bromance with yanni start and then why did you start jumping the, the london pond uh in the in winter okay me and yanni were friends ever since i moved to london in 2017 okay like we just became like friends we started drinking like we were in the same groups javascript we were already friends on twitter but like started hanging out at community meetings the pandemic happened and we realized that Exactly halfway between our houses was a park and it was a half hour away from each of us. So if you have one hour walking allowance that the government says you can do every day, we're like, okay, fine, we can walk to each other, sit on opposite sides of a bench, have a nice conversation and go back. We started meeting each other every day in the pandemic. Like, and I think we were already good friends, but like we became close during that time. Uh, and uh, started... Uh, both both of I uh, both of us uh, feel the same way about building software, shipping very small things very very often, etc. Uh, both of us had failures in our career that were mostly like personality driven uh, and good things that happened to us. Like we actually like share a bunch of our patterns in the last fifteen years of our career. Uh, in twenty twenty one summer. He was like, oh shit, Hampstead Heath has a pond. <laughs> and it was summer, which meant it was 22 degrees Celsius, which is, I don't know how much in Easy. Uh, Fahrenheit. Yeah. Uh, but super nice, like yeah. so pleasant. And he was like, hey, like it's actually closer to you than it is to me. I'm going to cycle over there. Do you want to come? I was like, yeah, I fucking love swimming. I haven't been. And I didn't know that this was a thing. There's a documentary about the ponds on Netflix called The Ponds. Okay. It's about 90 minutes long. It's amazing. You should watch it. It's so <laughs> sentimental. Like, I cried during the thing. I was, and I didn't expect to. I was like, yeah, I'll watch a documentary about the pond I go to every day. And I was crying through the middle of it. I was like, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> anyway, so we started going when it was warm. But we kept going. And it started getting colder. At some point, I was like, uh, around 15, 16 degrees is when I bought the, glo the neoprene gloves and socks. Okay. Because that's but you're still like... Bare skin otherwise. Bare skin otherwise. The whole way. No wetsuits. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend it, bro. I've been <laughs> peer pressured by my Finnish friend. That's what happened. Oh, this is a Finnish thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, right? Oh. He even introduced me to saunas and stuff, which I love as it turns out. Oh. I've never done a sauna in my life as well. But, but there's no sauna at the pond, just yeah. so very clear. Yeah. Uh, so it kept going. So I was like, okay, fine. I'll go until November in my birthday when the assumption was it would be 10 degrees. I was like, okay, if I have 10 degrees, I'm good. I don't want to go more. I did 10 degrees, I swam around for two and a half minutes and I was like, you know what, I'm going to keep fucking going. Because it turns out, look, there's a lot of the Wim Hof stuff, woo woo, it's good for you, all that. Uh, I don't subscribe to any of that, but I admit that you get a buzz that lasts the whole day. 
in fact the days that we don't go like i can tell like we message each other we're like fuck bro like i need to go back to the pod like it's weird and we started psyching each other out where we would send a message like even if we didn't mean it we would send out a message to each other at like 9 pm saying oh i'll see you at the pond tomorrow and the other person is a fucking like has an ego as well like yeah i'll see you at the fucking pond tomorrow and then we both regret it but we have made the commitment so we show up the next day anyway and you just go in and out or no 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 so like swim around well by the time it was like 2 degrees 1 degree like you can barely do like one or two minutes the uh, rough idea is you can do one minute per is it degree. not safe right what if you like uh get into shock which is why you have to start when it's 20 degrees your okay. body gets used to it we went like off. you should not start at 2 degrees yeah. yeah your body will go into shock yeah also uh, is there a lifeguard no, no there is a lifeguard at the okay. pond there, uh, there is there, there are lifeguards the water is treated it's not just a hole in the ground oh, by okay. the way yeah. watch the documentary yeah. <laughs> uh it's been around for like 200 years um uh, so uh, but you get used to it like your body like develops yeah uh, like it knows what's coming Uh, but you can only do like i can only do like one or two minutes at that temperature mm. uh, um, but in fact it's now started going up again in fact right before i came here it was about 16 17 degrees so i could do laps again it's just gorgeous uh the benefits are true man like you like it clears out you don't have twitter in the middle of the pond so like you have to swim and you're alone with your thoughts uh it's great uh I still recommend swimming in general like I li- I like swimming in pools anyway but the pond is where we go now. Uh so Yani and I uh, that's where the I mean he and I have seen each other's nipples now about 100 <laughs> times. What can I say man? It's true like that that sort of thing bonds to men man. <laughs> um okay yeah. Uh no I uh, so uh, in the American health circle tech bro circles there's all these uh philosophy about like ice baths. Yeah. Right. So I actually thought you started because of doing that. But I didn't I didn't know about the winter. No, no, no. It was just the summer thing, yeah. You just kept going swimming, yeah. man. It yeah. was uh, great. That's when we started. Yeah. I and think you might have independently discovered the health benefits of ice baths. Yeah. Uh Yani I think tried doing the Wim Hof breathing exercises etc for a while. I think I bought the book and I read like two pages and I was like, okay, I don't want to read this. Yeah. Uh but still good. I Yeah. There is def- there is a def- there is a definite buzz. It is very clear that it affects our mental health. Like every time we do it like that day it's good it's and do you do any other exercise uh, i was lifting for a while as you can tell look at how great i'm <laughs> like i'm a clearly a very buff dude i have weights and i lift that occasionally i love walking I, again because of the pandemic yeah we we'll walk back later yeah yeah uh, i love absolutely love walking uh, and london is a great city for walking there's sidewalks nice. everywhere like, so i used to live in waterloo oh, and i used to work in morgate So I used to cross the bridge every time. Love it. Yeah, I had three bridges to choose from. That's that would be about I want to say about a 20 25 minute walk. Yeah, roughly. Yeah. London's great for walking, and it's just pretty also, right? Like there's just so much, so many nice things to see. Uh, I I walk whenever I can. Uh, nice thing about being a founder of your own company, like you don't have a sure, nine o'clock meeting. Want. Yeah, you do whatever you like. It's <laughs> up to you. I was worried. But you have chosen an office. I have. That's right. You don't work from home. Huh? You don't work from home. Uh, I would like to work with these favorite people of mine oh, that I'm yeah. hiring. Yeah, that's true. I would like to be in person. It's not mandatory. No, every, anyone's free to come, but it is my job to make the office an appealing place to come to. Yes, I think uh, that's the job that I have, and I think I can do it. Yeah, I think I, we can figure it out. In your your office is how does it? Come? This is my office. How does? Uh, <laughs> see, I, you went from more modern. less deserted uh less deserted so apocalypse. for for context we are at a, we are in this uh, silo office which looks like a fucking bomb went off and everybody ran away by the way it's just abandoned as shit i like i like taking it away for that cuz i can show it right. it's actually a good one i think i might uh, this thing um uh i don't want to share too many details because like i said i'm just superstitious about these things until they're on paper but uh Yeah, by uh, August or so, I think uh, we'll move in. Cool. I'm very excited about it. It's it's bright. I'm going to visit. I'm going to visit. You come and stay. Like, yeah. I definitely. I I insist. Yeah. Uh, what about you? Uh, you're right now co-working here. Uh, are you? Once you hire, do you think you'll still be here? Do yeah. You... Uh, until they kick us out. Yeah. Um, awesome. Um, it's a very good deal. I get to be with my other founder friends uh, and ask them a lot of questions. And yeah, it's, it's super super helpful. Uh, at some point, I will. try to the the, the 
I, I care a lot about my family and uh, want to want to see uh, my my family more often. Mm -hmm. And so they're in Singapore, and so to me, the ideal setup is Superbase setup where it's like remote friendly. But there's a core team in Singapore with the Eng team in Singapore. You talk to Indian. That's right. Yeah, uh, and then the both founders are kind of based there, even though they're very nomadic. Um, so I, I was like, that, that's that's great. Um, it, you know, uh, it's good weather, um, good food, good tax and regime, and close to family. Mm -hmm. And the for all all other intents and purposes, they operate as a U.S. company, and uh, I I think that's a very good setup. So yeah, yeah, I would recommend it. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Um, any other uh, issues, topics? Mm -hmm. um, one last uh, closing thought. Um, ever since I've done this, I've spoken to a lot of VC firms, sure. But I've spoken to so many founders. And it has been absolutely wonderful. Uh, the analogy that I've started using is, uh, you ever played uh, Age of Empires? Mm. So when you start the game, you're one Wololo person. Yeah. but Wololo? Um, yeah, Wololo. You know Does he say that? Yeah, yeah he says, well, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, and the map is completely dark. Yeah. Uh, and you need to start walking around to remove the fog of war. Yeah. So I speak to all these founders and I ask for advice and I ask, like, hey, how's it going? And they're, every every single one has been so open to me, by the way. Like, they're always so happy. All their advice conflicts. Like, it's a spectrum of advice. And I, I start looking into it and I started noticing a pattern. I was like, oh, in the context of their thing, this thing made sense, etc., etc. But speaking to founders for me has been amazing because they are so useful at removing the fog of war uh, and knowing what your options are in running a business. And some of these people, like you are already my close friend. I've already made some other close friends. Uh, and a couple of things that they told me. One is that I should learn to like, uh, that I should be healthy, like do the yes. eight hours of sleep. And by the way, I... Yeah. I'm here for you. I will talk to you about it every that. day. I, need, I actually need small trainer. You uh, <gasps> you need small trainer, that's small right. Small trainer and then also yeah. So you know how um, Adam Wedden? Uh, yeah, uh, Kevin. Been, yeah, so yeah. he's been quite public about his own uh, health journey. And he looks amazing though. Like yeah. I saw his thing. But he has this very, very long running thread where he starts fat and then he, he's yeah. like now more more ripped. Um, and he's he credits it to this app um, that he I forget the name of the app. It's, it's some kind of long name. It's like three three words and it slips together. Here, here's what I can tell you about the journey, right? The health journey. Uh, the first week will suck. The second week sucks a little less. But by the time you get to five week five, you end up wanting to do it. Like the days you miss it, you're like, oh fuck, I need to go for a while. Yeah. It's I promise you, you 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 you'll actually like it. I hate this because I've never been that guy. Do you understand? I have been the phrase that I've been using with people is. Uh, uh, the unreasonable effectiveness of doing the basics. Yes. It is so annoying yes. that going for a walk and eating well is good for you. <laughs> you know, I'm like, fuck, I wanted a hack. I wanted a deeper truth here. No, it's just doing these yeah. things. Yeah. Lift weights when you're sad or some shit like that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so founders have been so helpful to me that uh, removing the fog of war. The first one is uh, like, yeah, just be healthy. But one founder gave me this one liner that I want to tattoo on my ass at some point where he says, uh, the pain is mandatory, but the suffering is optional. Okay. Uh, if you just lean into it and start getting uncomfortable with the uncertainty of things, you actually end up having the time of your life. And I think ever since he told me that, I've been like, yeah, like I kind of, kind of enjoy this journey, even yeah. though I don't know like how it ends or how it goes ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that quote is from somewhere. Uh, I probably. Seen it I assume. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think he was smart enough to come up with it first. Anyway, so you are going to have a lot more founders on this thing. You are going to speak to a lot of people. Actually, I was thinking it's just the two of us, actually. I would just love to do this every month. Yeah, so 100%. This, yeah, exactly. Small party, and then we just catch up. Exactly. Well, we should have other people on it as well, anyway. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, if the one thing that the podcast can do is to remove the fog of war for everybody exactly. else. Yes. Hell, man. That's, a, that's something worth doing anyway. Yeah. Amazing. So the next... Uh, Session is in London, I assume. <laughs> uh, actually, it could be it could be interesting. Uh, I haven't planned anything, but yeah. Well, I'll be back here in June anyway. We can do another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. That's it. Cheers, Thanks, man. man. Thanks. That's it. Yeah. It's uh, awkward to record, but also, I think it's just really nice. Uh,